Stepping into the world after graduating college is like unlocking a new chapter in life for many young adults, and that's precisely what 21-year-old Grace Mullane from Essex aimed to do after earning her degree from Lincoln University. She embarked on a thrilling journey exploring different places and meeting new people across the world. However, the excitement turned into a tragic event just before her 22nd birthday on December 1st, 2018. I saw that she was lying on the floor. I saw that she had blood coming from her nose. Um, I, I screamed, I yelled out at her and, I, I, or, and she was cold. Did you kill Grace Mullane? Who's the man seeing engaging in various unusual activities? What exactly happened to Grace on the evening of December 1st, 2018? The answer to these questions would take us to Auckland, the biggest city in New Zealand, and famous for its beautiful harbours, diverse culture, and lively city atmosphere. People from all over the world are drawn to its mix of modern living and natural wonders. One such tourist from England, 21-year-old Grace Mullane, also visited to experience the soothing nature and delicious food that Auckland has to offer. Sadly, in 2018, Auckland became known for a terrible crime that happened to Grace during her visit. Imagine a regular Tinder date turning into the worst mistake of your life. Well, that's what happened with 21-year-old Grace Mullane on December 1st, 2018. But before we dive into that, let's learn a bit about her. Grace Mullane was born on December 2nd, 1996 in Essex, England, to parents David and Gillian. She was the youngest of three children, with two older brothers named Michael and Declan. Grace was a cheerful and outgoing person who loved her family. She had a sociable and cheerful personality who always tried to make the most of life. We met when we were 10 years old, just starting secondary school together. And from the off, she just seemed like a really bubbly, kind, caring person. We spent sort of all of our break times, lunch times together. She was always looking after me. Um, she was always the one to take care of everyone else. After finishing high school, Grace went on to the University of Lincoln to study advertising and marketing for her bachelor's degree. During her time at university, she took up different jobs to save as much money as she could. But it wasn't just about work. She made lots of new friends and built strong connections. One of her friends, Jeff Kenworthy, highlighted how vibrant and lively Grace was during this time. She was in Lincoln in university. We arranged to meet there. She was very polite, she was very kind, but she didn't hold back from, like, taking the mic. So I felt like we had a little bit of banter. Grace had a passion for painting because she was super creative and artistic. She spent a lot of time creating paintings and loved sharing them with everyone. People admired how thoughtful Grace was in expressing herself through her art. She showed me some of her portraits when I was at her dorm. I was impressed. In September 2018, Grace happily finished her degree and got all dressed up in a cap and gown with pride. Instead of diving straight into grown-up responsibilities, she was thrilled for a new adventure before moving on to the next chapter of her life. She'd saved up for a whole year to embark on a backpacking tour and was all set for the exciting journey ahead. After graduating, Grace was known for her compassion and kindness. Before embarking on her trip, she did something really special. She chopped off her hair and donated it to the Little Princess Trust, which makes wigs for kids suffering from cancer. In October 2018, filled with excitement, Grace left her family home and headed off on her travels. The spirited graduate took off from Heathrow Airport and was ready for her first big adventure. For six weeks, Grace explored Peru on a backpacking adventure in South America. Surrounded by fellow travelers from all over the world, she immersed herself in the beauty of the country. Even though her time there was short, she treasured every moment, knowing it was just the start of her global journey. Grace excitedly shared every picture with her family, telling them how much she was loving every bit of her trip. On November 19th, 2018, Grace arrived in New Zealand, eager to explore the stunning beauty of the North Island. Unlike her planned trip in Peru, this time in New Zealand was a solo adventure, giving her the freedom to enjoy the experience at her own pace. New Zealand's a beautiful place. It's 
the most picturesque thing you could ever imagine. It's a very safe feeling place as well. Grace was just like everyone else you kind of meet when you're backpacking. You're all out there for the same adventure. I kind of continued um, exploring. I didn't feel like I'd, I'd seen enough. Grace went back to Auckland. After enjoying 10 wonderful days exploring the North Island, Grace decided to celebrate her upcoming 22nd birthday in the lively city of Auckland. She arrived in Auckland on November 30th, 2018, just two days before her big day. Staying at a popular hostel called the Base Backpackers Lodge on Queen Street, she shared a room with fellow travelers. That evening, Grace socialized with some new friends she'd met at the hostel, ready for a memorable birthday in the heart of New Zealand's largest metropolis. However, having an early night, Grace decided to browse the popular dating site Tinder while lying in bed. She was looking to connect with local people and make new connections during her stay. A lot of people do online dating. When you travel in, that's how a lot of people meet nowadays. And it can be a quick way to find someone that you, you maybe have some interests with. You know, you can quickly like, talk to them and have a phone call ever say, I'm traveling here, could you show me around here? On December 1st, 2018, at around 5.37 p.m., Grace stepped out of the hostel for a date night in the city center wearing a knee-length black dress, white shoes, and carrying a cute little handbag. She had exciting plans to meet someone special she'd matched with on Tinder. At first, Grace had been a bit unsure about the meetup, but after some more chatting, she and her date decided, why not? They made a plan to grab some drinks, and the chosen spot was none other than Sky City, a hip entertainment complex and casino just a stone's throw away from her hostel. Just before her date showed up, Grace took a photo in front of the Sky City Christmas tree and sent it to her family back home. After sending the message, Grace looked around and focused on her phone. It was around 5.54 p.m. when a guy in sneakers, jeans, and a light blue unbuttoned shirt walked up to her. They shared a quick hug, and then the two of them headed to a burger joint on the first floor. The evening was rolling, with no hint of the unexpected events that would follow. Here they had dinner, got to know each other better, and the connection between them clicked instantly. The vibe was so good that they decided to keep the date going. Their next stop was a Mexican bar in the complex to enjoy a few more margaritas. They got to the Mexican bar just after 7 p.m., spending the next hour and a half sipping on drinks and having a good time together. The night was turning out to be a blast for Grace on her pre-birthday celebration. At around 8.30 p.m., as you can see in the video, the man paid for the drinks while chatting with the bartender. After that, he and Grace headed out for their next destination, ready to keep the fun going on their evening adventure. About an hour later, they swung by a place called Blue Stone Room, a bar just a few minutes away from the man's apartment. At one point, Grace got up from the table, and for some strange reason, the man picked up her handbag and started searching for something. It was pretty suspicious, especially since they'd just met for the first time. It was during their time there when things got cozy as the two started flirting for about an hour. It seemed like a regular casual date with nothing out of the ordinary. When the man left the table and went to the bathroom, Grace seized the moment to text one of her friends back in England. She gushed about how great the date was going and how they connected. Being excited, she promised to spill all the details in the morning. Sadly, that follow-up message never arrived, and tragically, her friend never heard from Grace again. The next morning was December 2nd, 2018, the day of Grace's 22nd birthday. The day kicked off with a flood of text messages and missed calls from her loved ones, all excited to wish her a happy birthday. I messaged her on Snapchat um, saying happy birthday, hope you're having a lovely time. As the morning turned into afternoon and then evening, the festive wishes for Grace's birthday went unanswered. She wasn't picking up either of her two phones. Both were going straight to voicemail. She wasn't responding to any messages or sharing pictures of her trip to let everyone know how she was doing. You know, not getting a reply for a few days. I didn't really think much of it because I knew that she was traveling. When it came out that she hadn't, you know, responded to anyone, hadn't called anyone, I think that's when sort of the worry started to set in. Initially, Grace's parents weren't too worried at first due to the 13-hour time difference between the UK and New Zealand. 
They figured she might be out celebrating her birthday in an area with no cell phone reception. However, as hours turned into days with no word from their daughter, the silence became more pronounced and concerning. Grace was known for keeping her loved ones updated on her travels, never missing a day without checking in. Her sudden disappearance on her birthday was out of character, and the growing silence felt ominous to her worried parents. The fact that on her birthday, she hadn't contacted the family, and the family had not been able to contact her. That was a huge red flag. One of the girls from the group, uh, she messaged me and said, um, have I heard from Grace? There are obviously people at the backpackers who realised she was missing, were concerned. The biggest question on everyone's mind was, where was Grace? Feeling something was wrong, her father didn't hesitate. He bought a ticket to New Zealand and set off to find his daughter. Upon landing on December 5th, 2018, Grace's father's first move was to file a missing persons report with the local authorities. The New Zealand police were quick to respond and actively engaged with the case as soon as they heard about Grace's disappearance. It was just after lunchtime. I'd walk down into the crime squad office, which is the floor below where my office is, and I was talking to the detective senior sergeant, and she actually said, we've got a missing person complaint come in. The police contacted the hostel where Grace was staying, and they confirmed that she hadn't returned on the night of December 1st, 2018. At first, the police didn't suspect foul play because most of her belongings were still in her hostel room. But feeling the urgency and pressure, the police quickly organized a press conference to ask for help in finding 22-year-old Grace Mullane, who hadn't been seen since 7.15 p.m. on December 1st. Grace has been missing for several days. We last had contact with her on Saturday the 1st of December. Grace started this travel journey in Peru in South America and at the end of this was really looking forward to the second leg in New Zealand. Grace's family has launched a social media campaign urging people to report any sightings. Over 20 staff members were assigned to the case. They understood the importance of using social media and reporting to gather information and aid in locating Grace and solving the case. The community's support and eyes on the lookout were seen as important in this effort. I have worked on missing overseas tourist investigations previously. I knew just how much the international media would grip this up. One of our reporters flagged up that a 21-year-old Essex girl had gone backpacking on her own in New Zealand and she had gone missing in Auckland. We took a deep dive into exactly what had happened. Grace is one of our own, and we need to make sure that we do as much as we can to try and bring her home. We actually did a video appeal to try and find her. The social media reaction has to be some of the biggest I can remember. Luckily for detectives, it didn't take long to figure out who the last person Grace was seen with before her disappearance was. Their first move was to dig into her social media accounts to unravel the digital trail to piece together the events leading up to her vanishing. This digital detective work became a crucial step in the investigation. People's social media accounts are always important in this day and age because a lot of the young people live on social media. So getting into her Facebook page and seeing what she'd been doing was crucial. On the night Grace was last seen, she changed her Facebook profile picture and a comment was posted under it saying, beautiful, very radiant. This caught the attention of the police and the person behind the comment was identified as Jesse Kempson, who was staying at the City Life Hotel in Auckland. What raised more concern was a post Jesse had written earlier. In parts of the post, he expressed apologies for his mistakes, arrogance and selfishness. But first, let's learn more about Jesse. Jesse Kempson, 26 years old at the time, was born in Wellington and moved around a lot as a child after his parents separated. His grandparents played a role in raising him, but he became somewhat distant from many family members. People who knew Jesse described him as a pathological liar, someone who constantly told untruths about various aspects of his life. He had a habit of making up stories, like saying he was the cousin of a famous All Blacks rugby player or falsely claiming he was dying of cancer. His compulsive lying extended to everyone, employers, landlords, partners, and even his family and friends. 
Jesse's habit of constantly lying got him kicked out of many of his residences and caused him to lose jobs over and over again. He once told a former landlord that he was a pro softball player signed up by New Zealand's national softball team, the Black Sox, and claimed he was waiting for contract money. However, after eight weeks of excuses, the landlord got suspicious. When she contacted the Black Sox management, Jesse's lies were exposed again. His last job in telephone sales also ended in dismissal due to his lying, and this happened on the same day he met Grace Mullane on December 1, 2018. The police recognized him as the last person who was with Grace and realized he was the key to filling in the missing details in the investigation. So, on December 5, 2018, the day Grace was reported missing, the police went to the City Life Hotel to talk to Jesse. Just as they reached the front desk, Jesse also returned to the hotel. Strangely, the moment he spotted the police, he swiftly turned around and started walking away, keeping his head firmly facing the opposite direction. However, the police quickly noticed Jesse's attempt to avoid them, chased after him, and brought him in for questioning. Despite Jesse's efforts to appear innocent, his denial over any involvement in Grace's disappearance, and sometimes even his concern, the police continued their investigation. It's recording now. Uh, we, I've been in this room with you, I think, uh, since the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Just written down your details. Yeah. You were spoken to by yeah, Detective by... Hames and yeah. Detective Jordan. Yeah. That's in relation to a young lady, Grace Mullane. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. that's her there. You recognise her? Yeah. Okay. So that's Grace. She was 22 on the 2nd of December, just on her birthday. Yeah. Did you know that? Yes, so we talked about that, yes. Okay. Uh, so I was talking to Grace on Tinder. Yeah. Um, we'd matched on Friday. I saw that we'd matched um, the next day on the Saturday. I saw a message from her saying, hey. So I messaged back saying, hey, how are you? Um, how's your day going? I got a reply... Um, great, yeah, in, in you know, travelling around New Zealand, blah, 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 blah. She was staying at Party Backpackers and she told me that she was going to be spending her birthday out there the next day. During the interview, the police had an investigation team working hard and one crucial phase was examining CCTV footage. Auckland City has a lot of CCTV cameras which provided a vast amount of footage from the night Grace disappeared. Now, analyzing it took time because they had minute-by-minute -minute footage covering every area. This helped them to see how Grace and Jesse were interacting, how they were moving around, and how the date was progressing. I said, I know it's uh, quick, um, but do you want to catch up for a drink? Um, and she said, yep, yeah, cool. Um, she asked me where. I said, Sky City. And then uh, we met... I gave her a hug, she gave me a hug, um, and then we decided that we are going up to Andy's Burger Bar. She said, oh, I'm from Essex. Um, I said, is that near Geordie Shore? I, I had no idea where that was. Um, and she said, no, it's just out of London. Um, I said, oh, cool, yeah, sweet. Whose idea was it to go to that particular burger place? Me, because I knew, I didn't initially know that she was real. What do you mean? Well, there's a lot of... So have you heard of catfish? No. So catfishing is where someone uses your profile, or uses your photos and pretends to be you and then meets, and you're a completely different person. Right. Um, and it's happened to a few people I know in Australia, um, and it's all, over, it's all over the TV. So I thought, you know what, if I meet at Sky City... At least I know that there's lots of people around, so if it is someone that it's not, um, then I... While being interviewed, Jesse brought up the idea of catfishing, expressing concern about meeting someone who might not be Grace. He claimed he chose to meet her at Sky City in a busy crowd to ensure his safety. This seemed like an attempt to show innocence, suggesting that if it wasn't Grace, he too could have been at risk of disappearing. The police found his reactions and behavior a bit strange during the interview, especially considering that the woman he was with had actually disappeared that night. 
how does a how does meeting in a public place sort of protect you from well there's security you know, there so, so if she wasn't who she said she was yeah. um at least in my mind I'd feel safe right yeah okay what did you tell her about yourself uh, I just told her where my family were from I told her what I did for work um and then that was it mm-hmm I asked her if she's visiting Sydney, um, and she said she'd love to. How did the evening pan out? Mm, yeah, pretty good. How did the evening sort of come to an end? Uh, there was a hug and a kiss on the cheek um, and a thanks, no, nice meeting you. So at this point, you guys are heading in the direction of Victoria Street. Yeah, to the, exactly. to the crossing. Yeah, the crossing. Yeah. So... You cross over, and then you've parted company at around about 8 p.m. Yeah. At one point, Grace had a choice to make. She could either go to the right and head back to her accommodation at the base backpackers, or go in the direction of the City Life Hotel where Jesse was staying. And then you walk towards Queen Street? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And she walks towards the base. It was the intersection. Yeah. So I just crossed. Um, that would have been the last place I saw her. Okay. And you've parted company at around about 8 p.m. by yep. your account. Yeah. Over the next moments, as the investigators increased the pressure on Jesse, he seemed to get a bit uneasy, showing signs of slight panic. However, he continued to maintain that he had nothing to hide, despite the growing intensity of the questioning. It's entirely possible that she's been the victim of foul play. Okay. You understand what that means? Yeah. What would your feelings be about providing us with a voluntary DNA sample in the event that we can compare that against something? Would you be happy with that? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I know I haven't done anything wrong, so I'm happy to do it. Okay. At this stage, we don't know what's happened to this girl. Okay. Um, It's possible that somebody has killed her. Okay? Okay. You understand that? Yeah. She might, she might, when I say foul play, I mean that someone might have murdered her. I don't know if she's been murdered or not yet. She may be alive and well. Okay. But she might also be dead. Okay. Okay? And it could be that you've done it. Hey, I just want to ask a question. Mm. Am I being arrested for something I didn't do? You haven't been arrested, mate. Oh. No. Oh. Oh, sorry. Holy shit. He said nothing out of the ordinary had happened that night. According to him, the date ended well with a hug and plans for the following day. They parted ways around 10 p.m., and he mentioned that he tried to message her on Tinder the next day, only to discover that Grace had unmatched him. This was where their interactions abruptly ended, as per Jesse's account. However, the officers were still in the process of reviewing CCD footage from the City Life Hotel, and more answers to lingering questions were about to emerge. Despite Jesse's claim that they parted ways on the streets, the footage revealed something different. Both Jesse and Grace were seen arriving at the City Life Hotel arm in arm, looking happy. They even exited the elevator together on Jesse's floor. However, surprisingly, there was no footage of Grace leaving the building, which raised alarming questions about what might have happened after they entered the hotel. On the morning of Grace's birthday, cameras captured Jesse leaving the hotel, but there was no sign of Grace. The cameras kept a close eye on him in the hours that followed, tracking his every move. Jesse left the hotel and embarked on a curious series of activities. His first stop was shopping for a suitcase from a nearby store. Next, he made a detour to buy cleaning supplies. Then, before noon, he hopped into a taxi and headed to a car rental company, where he decided to rent a flashy red Toyota Corolla. After several hours, Jesse met another woman he had connected with on Tinder. She later reported disturbing conversations that she had during their encounter. In a shocking turn of events, he talked about burying bodies, how to get rid of the smell of blood, and claimed to have friends who were police officers. His date felt extremely uneasy, so much so that she turned down Jesse's offer to ride in his car. Instead, she chose to make her own way home and decided never to talk to him again. Following the unsettling date, Jesse ventured into the city centre again, but this time he had an unusual task, which was renting a rug doctor carpet cleaning machine. 
When the staff questioned him about why he needed it, Jesse calmly explained that he had some red wine stains that needed cleaning up soon. Despite the peculiar request, Jesse appeared calm and normal during this interaction. Later, around half past nine in the evening, Jesse was spotted loading two suitcases onto a hotel trolley. He then unloaded them into the Toyota he'd rented earlier. After placing the bags in the trunk of the car, he went back to his room for the night. The next morning, around 7 a.m., Jesse appeared on camera once more. This time, he went to a nearby store and bought a shovel. After that, he got into the rented car and went for a drive. About two hours later, he was again seen at a local car wash, thoroughly cleaning the vehicle. It was a meticulous job before he returned back to his apartment. These actions, especially buying a shovel, raised further concerns and added to the mysterious series of events connected to Jesse. Finally, on December 5th, 2018, the day Jesse was questioned, he was observed visiting different places, including Albert Park, where he disposed of things in bins which were wrapped in black bags. Despite Jesse denying any involvement during the questioning, the police began to seriously suspect him. That Thursday night, we arranged for a search warrant for his apartment at City Life Hotel. The forensic scientists were going to test Kempson's apartment for blood. And they used a chemical called luminol, which they spray. Luminol will react with blood and it will glow in the dark. The forensic search of Jesse's room uncovered even more disturbing details. Despite Jesse's efforts to clean up, they found Grace's blood all over the floor. The luminol started glowing in almost the entire room, which exposed to what extent the attempt to clean up went. Not only that, but it also showed that while the blood was already wet, Jesse had walked through it many times. As time passed, people grew more fearful, and the police expressed serious concerns for Grace. On December 8, 2018, with an increasing amount of evidence emerging, Jesse was finally taken into custody for further interviews. This time, when he was confronted with everything the officers had discovered, his story underwent a drastic change. Tell me what happened last Saturday. I remember leaving Bluestone. I don't know what time we, we left there exactly. The next thing I remember after that is being in the room with Grace. She started talking to me about uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, which is a, a, a sex fantasy um, movie. We started having, I guess, uh, violent sex, um, and then she told me to hold her throat. And then at that point, um, we'd finished. All I remember is falling asleep in the shower. In the further interview, Jesse claimed that when he woke up the next morning and realized Grace was dead, he went into shock. However, this raised many questions about how someone couldn't realize the well-being of their partner after an intimate moment to the point where she could even die. Despite this, Jesse continued to deny any guilt in Grace's killing. I woke up the next day. Um, initially, I thought Grace had left, and I saw that she was lying on the floor. Um, I saw that she had blood coming from her nose. Um, I, I screamed, I yelled out at her, and I, I tried to, to move her to see if she was awake. And that's when I, I panicked because I couldn't hear or, and she was cold. Jesse's first and second interviews presented a total contradiction. According to the interviewer, he appeared to be a narcissistic sociopath who was acting for his own pleasure. In Jesse's version, he claimed to be so scared that he had the presence of mind to plan and decide to pack Grace's body in a suitcase and bury it somewhere to hide all the evidence. However, he seemed to have overlooked the fact that CCTV cameras captured all of his movements and revealed the inconsistencies in his stories. Did you consider seeking help from St. John's? I dialed 111, um, but I didn't hit the button um, because I, 
I was scared how bad it looked. You said you didn't know what to do. Why did you purchase a suitcase? Because I was freaking out. I went to the warehouse at the atrium and brought a suitcase. I remember putting Grace in the suitcase. I was, I was just in shock the whole time. I put Grace in the back of a hire car. I drove the hire car into Wilson's car park. I sat there for a little while, praying. I picked up a, a shovel. I ended up driving towards the white tackeries. I went into the bush. I dug a hole. We're going to head out of here very, very soon and you're going to take us to where you've buried her. Yeah. To your knowledge, did Grace die while she was in your company? Um, to my knowledge, I would, I would say yes. And at any time and at any stage, did you intend to cause her death? No. Did you kill Grace Mullane? No. Okay. Jesse Kempson, you're under arrest for the murder of Grace Mullane on or about the 2nd of December. You understand? Yep. Jesse was then officially charged and held in police custody. While behind bars, the investigation continued and it revealed more disturbing details. Between December 1st and December 7th, it was discovered that Jesse made a series of unsettling Google searches. This included the night of December 1st around 1.30 a.m. while Grace lay dead in his room. Jesse looked up topics like hottest fire, flesh-eating birds, and the Waitakere Ranges, the location where he buried Grace's body. Following these searches, he visited an adult site and took several intimate photos of Grace's lifeless body. These actions, not indicative of shock, suggested that he was aware of his actions and intentionally did it. Meanwhile, based on the information Jesse provided during the interview, the police quickly initiated a search on December 9, 2018 in an area on Scenic Drive near the Waitakere Reservoir. Shortly after 4 p.m., officers discovered a body about 10 yards from the road. The swift action by law enforcement led to the tragic confirmation that it was none other than Grace's body, marking a somber conclusion to the investigation. We located a body which we believe to be Grace. The formal identification process will now take place. However, based on the evidence we have gathered over the past few days, we expect that this is Grace. And what we know is that Kempton strangled Grace for seven to 10 minutes. That's not rough sex, that's murder. Grace's parents had clung to hope that their daughter might be safe somewhere and would come back home, but this news completely shattered their world. The moment was painfully emotional for everyone involved in the search. Grief spread across the nation and thousands of people paid tribute to Grace by participating in vigils. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern publicly apologized to Grace's parents and extended her full support during this heart-wrenching time. The collective mourning reflected the impact of Grace's tragic fate on the entire community. Firstly, I cannot imagine the grief of her family and what they will be experiencing and feeling right now. And so, on behalf of New Zealand, I want to apologize to Grace's family. Your daughter should have been safe here, and she wasn't, and I'm sorry for that. Jesse Kempson faced murder charges for Grace Mullane, and on December 10th, 2018, just nine days after Grace's death, he appeared in an Auckland court. To guarantee a fair trial, he was given interim name suppression. This legal measure aimed to avoid prejudicing the trial proceedings by limiting the release of certain details to the public during this early stage. Following an autopsy, a pathologist confirmed that Grace had been strangled. The examination revealed bruises on her arms and chest, which indicated that she'd been pinned down. The pathologist explained that causing these injuries required considerable force 
and the pressure on her neck must have endured for four to five minutes, long enough to lead to Grace's tragic death. And in this case, there was an area of significant bruising, um, and it was on the left side of the neck, and it basically extended from the jaw down. There has been sufficient pressure in that place to, for a sufficient period of time and for sufficient force for that bruising to occur. More than a month after her death, on January 10, 2019, hundreds of people gathered for her funeral at Brentwood Cathedral in Essex. Detective Scott Beard, who had been involved in the case, flew to England to pay his respects and offer support to the Mullane family. The turnout reflected the widespread sympathy and shared grief felt by the whole community during this somber occasion. On January 16th, 2019, just six days after Grace was laid to rest, Jesse appeared in the High Court and entered a plea of not guilty. The trial started on November 4th, 2019, lasting for three weeks. Throughout most of it, Jesse maintained a stone-faced demeanor and displayed no emotions. Jesse's defense team, led by Ian Brookie, argued that Grace's death was a result of consensual rough intimacy that had gone terribly wrong. They claimed that Grace had been involved in similar physical encounters before meeting Jesse, and this instance was a tragic case of physical misadventure. The defense sought to frame the events leading to Grace's death within the context of consensual actions that took an unintended and unfortunate turn rather than a deliberate act. They asserted that Jesse, in a state of panic, tried to hide Grace's body after realizing that the encounter had accidentally led to her death. They portrayed his subsequent attempts to conceal Grace's body as impulsive responses to a situation that had spiraled out of control. The defense case is that this is not a murder. And that's still what I say to you now. Nothing has changed. It was an accidental death that took place in the context of sexual activities that if done incorrectly by inexperienced and or intoxicated people can go wrong. It doesn't matter whether she was having sex or not, or it doesn't even come into it. The only thing that's important is that he went into that room, she went into that room, and only one person came out of there. As the defense aimed to depict Grace's murder as accidental, prosecutor Crown Solicitor Brian Dickey presented a substantial amount of strong evidence and witnesses. Dickey countered the notion that Jesse panicked, emphasizing that this wasn't a mere mistake. According to him, the evidence pointed to a deliberate and intentional act. Jesse systematically and coldly attempted to cover his tracks by consistently lying and fabricating numerous stories in the process. In this case, to have killed Grace Mullane, the defendant, gentleman over here at the back behind me, had to have had her under his grip, suffocating her, if that's the right term, strangling her is probably the correct term, for a total of five to ten minutes, at some point of which she lost consciousness and would have become under his hand hold, unconscious and limp and lifeless, and he had to carry on. And if that's not reckless murder in this country, ladies and gentlemen, somebody will have to explain to me what is. On November 22, 2019, after only five hours of deliberation, a jury comprising seven women and five men returned a guilty verdict, rejecting Jesse Kempson's claims of innocence. He was found guilty of the murder of Grace Mullane and received a life sentence in prison on February 21, 2020, with a minimum non-parole period of 17 years. This meant he'd be eligible for parole after serving at least 17 years behind bars. Ms. Mullane's lifeless body was with you in that room when you searched for and accessed four pornographic sites. These were not the actions of a man in panic, far from it. Your actions reveal a complete disregard for your victim. This jury having found you guilty of the murder of Grace Emmy Rose Mullane, you are convicted. The verdict of murder today will be welcomed by every member of the Mullane family and friends of Grace. It will not reduce the pain, the suffering that we've had to endure for over the past year.
I heard it on the radio and I literally just like burst out and crying like I was, oh, it hit me like a truck. I called my mum before anything else. I was just screaming down the phone. I was shaking. I remember it was just, you know, it was a horrible feeling. The biggest emotion is anger. Like, how dare he put his hands on it? <sighs> you feel a bit guilty. You know, maybe we could have done more. She should have been safe. The case sparked widespread anger as many criticized and expressed frustration about how Grace's life was portrayed during the trial and how her death was rationalized by her killer. Many saw it as shameful victim blaming rather than holding the killer accountable. However, the story didn't conclude there as Jesse faced two more trials the following year. In October 2020, two women came forward with harrowing stories after seeing Jesse's blurred image following his arrest for Grace's murder. The first trial involved an ex-partner of Jesse who spoke about enduring physical, emotional, and financial abuse. Jesse used to hold knives to her throat, choked her, coerced her into consensual acts, and drained her account of $10,000. For this, he was found guilty of eight charges and sentenced to seven and a half years in prison. In November 2020, Jesse faced another trial for physically abusing a young tourist he met on Tinder just eight months before meeting Grace. He tried to force himself on her and threatened to harm her and her family if she didn't comply. For this, he was found guilty and received an additional three and five years in prison, bringing the total to 11 years which would be running concurrently with a sentence for Grace's murder. Unfortunately, in November 2020, Grace's father, David Mullane, passed away after battling cancer. Grace's parents never had the opportunity to see their daughter again. She was a lively and adventurous girl, always eager to explore new things. Unfortunately, she set out on a journey from which she never returned home, leaving her spirit high, but her presence sorely missed. Out of this tragedy, the Mullane family have started the Love Grace campaign. That's getting handbags and then filling them with items for the victims of domestic violence. And when I speak to Gillian, you know, she tells me that there's handed out over 10,000 handbags. Now, she describes that to me as 10,000 smiles. That is so touching. One of the things that comes out of this is that you know, women should be allowed to do what they want without having a sexual predator do what he wants and take in her life. You hope for all hope that another person doesn't suffer the same fate or family go through the same ordeal. On the night of September 28, 2017, 27-year-old Nikki Adamando had something heavy on her heart. Just moments before, she took a drastic step to protect herself and her children. Nikki revealed that she'd shot her boyfriend, Chris Grover, who had been consistently abusing and threatening her. He had shot you down, but I didn't know what it was at that point. And you have no idea what he might have. So how many shots were fired? One. We came to the couch, and I need him, and it fell, and I picked it up. He said, I will kill you, and I will kill you, and the kids will have nobody. The news stunned everyone who knew them because no one expected such a shocking outcome. I never in a million years had a fear that he would die. I was afraid she would die every day. Nikki had been silently enduring years of abuse from Chris. Whether it was her friends, therapist, or colleagues at work, everyone could see the bruises and burn marks on her body. However, she hesitated to report it to the police because she always feared losing her kids. Now this woman, unmistakably a victim of domestic violence, finds herself in a twisted struggle to convince the investigators that she took Chris's life in self-defense. Obviously self-defense, right? I mean, come on. 
I mean, I, I can't make that determination right now. After the interview, Nikki's arrest sparked numerous people hitting the streets to support her. On the flip side, loyal supporters of Chris insisted he was a gentle, loving person who could never harm anyone. Amidst the chaos, the lingering question emerges, was Nikki truly a victim of domestic violence or a manipulative liar? Poughkeepsie, New York, is a city known for its historical charm and location along the Hudson River. However, it has gained notoriety due to the high-profile murder cases that have occurred here, including the 2017 incident involving Nicole Adamando. Despite these tragic events, Poughkeepsie remains a diverse community with various cultural and recreational offerings. But what happened with Nikki Adamando that made the whole Poughkeepsie community come out of their houses to support her? Let's find out. Late one September night on September 28, 2017, Officer Richard Sicily patrolled the quiet streets of Poughkeepsie, New York. It was around 2 a.m. when he found himself behind a car halted at a red light. When the light switched to green, the car ahead remained stationary. Suspecting a drowsy or inattentive driver, Officer Sicily gave a polite honk. Little did he know, this seemingly routine moment was about to take an unexpected turn. Seeing the car unmoving, Officer Sicily stepped out of his cruiser and went towards it. At that moment, a petite woman, just five feet tall and no more than a hundred pounds, emerged from the driver's seat. She was barefoot and appeared highly distressed. In the back seat, two children were peacefully asleep. The officer considered possibilities. Perhaps the woman was lost or there was a medical issue, but he was completely unprepared for what this distressed woman was about to reveal. You need to relax, okay? Just take a few deep breaths. You need to relax, okay? Just take a few deep breaths. The agitated woman in stocking feet was 28-year-old Nikki Adamando, who quickly informed the officer that something had gone terribly wrong at her home. He's laying on the couch. That one. He's just laying there. He said, if you leave, I'll kill you. What did he? Chris Grover. Chris Grover? Dad and his dad. Next door is going to be a Chris Grover. Chris Grover. Nikki explained that she'd been enduring abuse for a long time by her boyfriend, which reached a breaking point on September 28th, 2017. When she tried to leave, her boyfriend, armed with a gun, pointed it at her and made threatening gestures. So I picked it up and he said, you wouldn't do it. And Police officer Cecilia, I think, is in shock that this is unfolding before him. You know, if there's an ambulance that's necessary, there are two children in the car. After talking to the officer, Nikki urgently called her friend for help. Without delay, Elizabeth Clifton responded to Nikki's distressing call. When she arrived, the officers requested her to wait in a nearby parking lot. They held off on Nikki and Elizabeth meeting right away because there were still some details they needed to find out. But who was Nikki Adamando? Nicole Adamando, who goes by Nikki, was born on November 19, 1988. When she was just four years old, she moved to Poughkeepsie, New York, with her family. Growing up, she was known as an energetic, carefree, and outgoing little girl. In 2008, when Nikki was just 19 years old, she started working at a local gym called Mr. Ton's Gymnastics. There she worked as a children's gymnastics coach. It was there that she met Christopher Grover, a fellow coach and co-worker who was 21 years old. In a short time, they became more than just co-workers. Chris became Nikki's life partner. Sadly, Nikki claimed to have shot Chris that night because he'd been continuously abusing and threatening her. The officer went to Nikki's apartment and discovered Chris, her partner, apparently asleep on the couch, but he was already dead from a single gunshot to the head. When they searched the entire apartment, they found the shower running in the bathroom and a broken laptop in the bathtub. Meanwhile, Elizabeth had also heard about Chris's death, and it was incredibly shocking for her because she'd never anticipated such a tragic outcome. I had a fear that he would die. I was afraid she would die every day. Everything seemed confusing, and the only person who could answer all the questions was Nikki herself. So they brought Nikki to the station for questioning, as they wanted to know why she'd killed Chris. Was it truly due to domestic violence, or was there something else going on? 
In the meantime, Gail Grover, Chris's mother, received the heart-wrenching news from the sheriff that her son had passed away. Gail's immediate concern was for Nikki and the kids. When she asked the sheriff, her main question was, are Nikki and the kids okay? Gail expressed that she had no idea what had truly gone wrong with Chris. She described Chris as a kind and athletic person. He was super energetic, outgoing, and very charming. Chris had a black belt in Taekwondo and served as the head gymnastics coach at Mr. Todd's gym in Poughkeepsie. His students at the gym loved him because he made gymnastics fun with his energetic coaching style. When he first met Nikki in 2008, their close work led to a deep friendship. Over time, their connection turned romantic and they officially started dating. By 2012, they decided to live together and Nikki shared that Chris was a remarkably supportive, compassionate, and understanding partner. He assured her he'd wait until she was ready, and after about a year, they happily announced Nikki's pregnancy. Their first child, named Ben, arrived in 2013, and things were going well. Chris proved to be a fantastic father who was deeply in love with Nikki and their child. It wasn't long before two years later, Nikki became a mother again in 2015, welcoming their daughter Fane into the family. Was he excited about being a Absolutely dad? Absolutely yeah. ecstatic. He was a, a proud papa. Everyone saw Nikki as an excellent mother because her love for her children was the most important thing to her. Nikki is the most gentle, loving friend we've ever had. Everything she does is for her kids. Nikki and Chris's story, like any other, wasn't perfect. But what caught Elizabeth's attention first were some strange changes in Nikki. She noticed that Nikki seemed even more anxious than usual. Despite being a really gentle and soft-spoken person, she became more skittish. She wasn't sleeping well, she was eating less, and just didn't seem to be doing well overall. Elizabeth thought these changes were because Nikki was now simultaneously studying early childhood education, working at a preschool, taking care of her kids, and still keeping up with her job at the gym, causing a lot of stress. She came to class with what looked to me like a black eye. She covered herself completely. Mm -hmm. And even in the summer, she'd be wearing long sleeves, long pants, have a scarf covering around her neck. Not just Elizabeth, but Nikki's childhood friends, Laura Macadanu and Rachel Hawks, also noticed something odd about Nikki. It wasn't just her behavior, but she had injuries all over her body. There were bruises on many parts that were clearly visible. There were so many instances where I would notice a bruise, would often say, you know, oh, I was playing with Ben and I got hit by his guitar. You know, it was always something that to me at the time seemed very... It was plausible. Plausible. I didn't, um, I didn't think twice about it. On September 28th, 2017, Child Protection Services, or CPS, visited Chris's apartment after an anonymous parent from the gym where Chris still worked, reported her concerns. The parent had seen Chris losing his temper with students and noticed Nikki covered in marks and worried about her and the kids at home. But later that night, Chris was found dead in his apartment, and in the interrogation room, Nikki was trying hard to explain why she'd killed Chris. He faced me, and then he looked up for a second, and I just, like, obviously self-defense, right? Nikki genuinely believed the detectives would see that she acted in self-defense rather than intentionally killing Chris. She thought her actions, along with evidence showing her innocence, would make it clear it was self-defense. However, the twist came when Nikki was arrested for killing Chris. Despite everyone close to her and her supporters, who believed that Nikki, the victim of domestic violence, was held responsible for choosing to defend herself, being heartbroken by the news, a lingering question remained. Why was Nikki arrested when it seemed like she was the victim? Somehow, Elizabeth had the answer to this, and it all began in April 2016 when Elizabeth expressed her concerns about Nikki's injuries. She was genuinely scared for Nikki, always worried about her safety at home with Chris. In response, Nikki admitted to Elizabeth that Chris was abusing her every day, but she wasn't alone in uncovering the truth. Journalist Rachel Snyder, who dedicated 10 years to studying domestic violence, stumbled upon Nikki's case. After reading many articles and talking to numerous people, Snyder also believed that Chris was physically trying to force himself on Nikki. In the beginning, even though Chris was sometimes violent, things weren't too bad. 
During Nikki's pregnancy in 2013, he was gentle, sweet, and caring. Nikki felt hopeful, thinking the baby might improve their relationship. The excitement of becoming parents made their relationship less rocky. However, after their son Ben was born, things took a turn for the worse. Nikki decided to leave her job at the preschool and focus on starting her own photography business, along with selling homemade booties for infants. While Chris was initially a great father and helpful with Ben, about six weeks later, he began pressuring Nikki for intimacy, which caused a strain on their relationship. And he slammed her head into the doorframe of Ben's room and then f***ed her. A few days later, Nikki's face and jaw were so swollen that she couldn't even chew, and she went to Vassar Brothers Hospital in Poughkeepsie for medical help. Her condition was so bad that they decided to call a domestic assistance program and convince Nikki to take action. The examiner noted in the records that Nikki's injuries were so severe that she had to speak very softly, and it was hard to hear what she was saying. Nikki chose not to file a police report because she was afraid Chris would take Ben away from her. Unfortunately, the troubles didn't end there. Two years later in 2015, after their daughter Fane was born, a similar incident occurred. A few weeks later at home, Nikki was cooking eggs for Ben when Chris demanded she make enough for him too. In a sarcastic tone, Nikki replied, Yes, sir, which made Chris extremely angry. He grabbed a metal spoon and heated it on the gas stove flame. Then he held Nikki's other arm and burned her in several places with the hot spoon. Nikki, in excruciating pain, was only able to plead for him to stop. She sought medical treatment again, and this time, the examiner took pictures of Nikki's injuries. The images captured bite marks on her shoulder and back, along with burns covering her body. He was, as far as I understand, tying her up. You know, I remember seeing the marks around her neck and wrists. I mean, what he was doing was f***ing her. Chris's addiction to violent adult internet content took a dark turn for Nikki as he wanted to reenact things he saw in those videos and even created elaborate setups for aggressive acts against her. Tying her up, attacking her, and at one point using a weapon to choke her until she passed out, he went to extreme lengths. Shockingly, he recorded all of this without Nikki's consent. Despite the horrific abuse, Nikki hesitated to report it to the police. She feared that if she identified herself as a victim, Child Protective Services might take her kids away. This fear haunted Nikki, and she was determined not to lose her kids at any cost. Nikki's friend Elizabeth and many others urged her to press charges against Chris, but fear emotionally paralyzed her. In 2016, Elizabeth went the extra mile to help Nikki leave her house. Nikki even packed her kids into the car and drove to Elizabeth's house, but she couldn't bring herself to stop. Nikki circled in front of the house, slowing down and then speeding up again. For hours, Elizabeth watched as Nikki drove past repeatedly. When Elizabeth called out for her to stop and come inside, Nikki tearfully admitted she couldn't do it. The fear of Chris's reaction held her captive, and she couldn't bring herself to stop the car because she believed Chris would never forgive her. And that's what a domestic violence victim leaving looks like. It looks like a series of false starts. In this mindset, her terror of him is stronger than her belief that the system will save her. Throughout 2017, Nikki sought medical help multiple times for various violent incidents. First, it was rope-like burns around her neck and using it on her body. She was often bruised and bleeding. Then Nikki reported Chris having a gun and using it to try to be physical with her. Then finally came September 28, 2017, with the anonymous visit from Child Protective Services, and all eyes were on them. The worker wrote on a piece of paper, Are you safe right now? And discreetly showed it to Nikki, who nodded yes. The worker then asked if there were any weapons in the house, but Nikki lied, saying there weren't any, even though Chris owned a gun. When the worker questioned her about the bruises that Nikki had, both Chris and Nikki claimed they were just having normal fights and arguments like any other couple. So the worker didn't find any reason to take emergency action and left from there. Meanwhile, Chris had also left the house but returned back in the evening. According to Nikki, he seemed calm and even kind. Surprisingly, they were intimate after the kids went to sleep, 
and this time Chris was much gentler than Nikki had grown accustomed to. After leaving the room at one point, Chris called Nikki again, and this time he was holding his gun. He asked her to look at it and began showing how it worked, loading it while she was just nervously watching him doing that. In a chilling moment, he casually mentioned, You know, I could kill you in your sleep, making Nikki feel extremely unsafe. She tried to relax by taking a shower. However, while she was in the shower, Chris unexpectedly entered the bathroom, saying he could shoot her in there, but it would be too loud. Shockingly, he then threw the laptop into the tub, and after Nikki got out of the shower, Chris forced himself onto her, creating a distressing and uncomfortable situation. As soon as she walked into the living room, Chris instructed Nikki to lie down on top of him on the couch. Nikki, feeling fearful, complied for a while, but when she sensed that Chris had finally fallen asleep, she cautiously tried to sneak away. However, her attempt took a frightening turn when Chris suddenly woke up and pulled the gun from the couch cushion. In a bid to protect herself, Nikki swatted away Chris's arm, and as a result, Chris dropped the gun on the floor, which gave Nikki the chance to swiftly grab it and point it at him. Strangely, Chris nonchalantly reclined on the couch, seemingly unconcerned. This lack of worry might have stemmed from the damage he'd already done to Nikki's self-esteem and confidence. Chris then taunted Nikki, saying she would never shoot him, and threatened a grim outcome, saying, You're gonna give me the gun, and I'm gonna kill you, then take my own life, and your kids will have nobody. He barely finished his sentence when Nikki, without any hesitation, lunged at him with the gun and pulled the trigger. At that moment, Nikki said it was a matter of kill or be killed. The night took a shocking and unexpected twist when Nikki, instead of being seen as a victim, found herself arrested for the death of Chris Grover. In March 2019, Nikki Adamando, who was out on bail, faced trial for the murder of her partner, Chris. The Poughkeepsie court became a gathering place for friends and advocates who were all wearing purple, the color symbolizing victims of domestic violence, showing their support. On one side stood loyal supporters of Chris who were convinced that he was a calm and gentle person who could never harm anyone. They were shocked to hear that Nikki's defense relied on claims of his alleged abuse and violence towards her. Chris's mother, Gail, steadfastly rejected these allegations and maintained her belief in her son's innocence throughout the trial. Chris didn't do this. My son never hurt anybody. And that's the bottom line. The courtroom became a battleground of conflicting perspectives on a tragic and twisted case of violence. Inside the Dutchess County Courthouse in Poughkeepsie, prosecutors contended that Nikki portrayed herself as a victim, asserting that all our claims about domestic violence from Chris were false. Prosecutor Hannah Krause, who had dedicated much of her career to advocating for victims of physical abuse, remained skeptical of Nikki's narrative. To her, Nikki didn't fit the typical profile of an abuse victim. During the trial, Prosecutor Krause highlighted the first piece of physical evidence, the gun Nikki used to kill Chris. She emphasized that Chris sustained a direct contact wound to the head. Also, the medical examiner's testimony added weight to this, stating that the gun muzzle imprint on Chris's head indicated it was embedded when Nikki pulled the trigger. So if Chris had been awake, Nikki wouldn't have been able to shoot at such close range. This suggested that Chris was likely asleep at the moment of the incident, casting doubt on Nikki's narrative of trying to save herself. Krauss also argued that it was actually Nikki, not Chris, who threw the laptop in the tub, suggesting maybe Nikki wanted to make it appear as if Chris was trying to hide the evidence of violence which was recorded on it. However, Nikki might not have anticipated that the laptop could be recovered in such a way that its contents could be examined, revealing there was absolutely no evidence of abuse. To support her claim, Krauss presented a series of texts Nikki sent to Chris days before his death, where she called him a man-child and questioned his intelligence. According to Krauss, these texts suggested that Nikki was the one who was abusing Chris. Adding a twist to the case, Krauss also presented damning evidence, which was multiple internet searches on Chris's phone on the night he died, and she believed that Nikki was behind these searches. Fifteen minutes of searches that are a roadmap to exactly how he was murdered. In a text sent six weeks before the incident, Nikki expressed her frustration, saying, 
I haven't figured out a way to kill him without being caught, so I'm still here. This led the prosecutor, Krauss, to discuss a dark chapter in Nikki's life, which actually completely changed her. She acknowledged that Nikki had suffered a traumatic experience when she was just five years old during her first sleepover at her friend Caitlin's house. Caitlin lived with her mother and her mother's boyfriend, whom she referred to as Uncle Butch. In the middle of the night, Nikki, who was sleeping with Caitlin, was suddenly awakened by Butch, who was attempting to force himself on her. Unfortunately, Caitlin, also a victim of Butch, couldn't help Nikki in that distressing moment. When Nikki shared this incident with her mother Belinda, it was met with denial and a request to forget about it. However, this incident had a profound impact on Nikki, transforming her into an extremely shy and quiet person. It altered her ability to trust people and influenced how she formed relationships. When Nikki met Chris, she was still haunted by past experiences, which made intimacy uncomfortable for her. Despite this, Chris, seeming to be a caring partner, respected her feelings and agreed to wait until she felt ready. His love and care for Nikki remained unwavering throughout. Now, if Chris was always kind to Nikki, then how did the stories of abuse start? Krauss claimed that Nikki invented these stories of abuse by Chris. She pointed out that Nikki never reported these allegations to the police, but only shared them with friends and therapists. A few years into her relationship with Chris, Nikki shared with the therapist that when she lived in an apartment complex with her mother, her mother would invite maintenance workers over for shots of alcohol. On a day when Nikki was home alone, a maintenance worker came by for repairs and attempted to force himself on her. However, Nikki later admitted that her memories of the attacker were unclear, and she wasn't sure if it was from the maintenance worker or if she'd mixed it up with memories involving Chris. How do you not remember which abuse was by the maintenance worker and which abuse was by your partner? Around the same time, Nikki met a married police officer who was the father of one of her gymnastics students. He offered Nikki the opportunity to move in with him, his wife, and children to work as a babysitter. Initially, she viewed the 45-year-old man as a protector and even a father figure. However, as Nikki lived with the family longer, she became increasingly uncomfortable. There was even a point when he attempted to abuse and force himself on Nikki. It's challenging to comprehend the circumstances under which their relationship began, especially considering she was still living with Chris and was pregnant with Ben. Now, when discussing the marks and bruises on Nikki's body, Krauss argued that her injuries often had innocent explanations. Not all bruises were the result of violence. Many were actually self-inflicted. Krauss pointed out that even all the medical records weren't straightforward. In Nikki's first visit to Vassar Brothers Hospital, she was asked a series of questions regarding the abuse, the injuries inflicted on her, and the burn marks all over her body. At that time, Nikki consistently answered no, denying that anyone had harmed her. However, after Fane was born, she returned to the hospital and this time answered yes to every single one of those questions. Krauss suggested that Nikki was trying to blame Chris for all the abuse that she went through, making him the main culprit behind it. After the Child Protective Services visit that night, Nikki feared that her made-up abuse stories would be exposed and she might lose her kids, which was her greatest fear. She was not the victim in this case. Chris was the victim in this case. And that became very, very apparent. I think people need to understand what really happened here. And what really happened here? Chris Grover was asleep when she killed him. That's what happened here. As the defense case unfolded, attorneys John and Ben Oster argued that Nikki lived in constant danger with Chris. They asserted that if she hadn't fought back and killed him that night, it would have been her life in jeopardy instead of Chris's. During the trial, Nikki's lawyers had the task of persuading the jury that on the night of September 28, 2017, she acted in self-defense. Their argument centered around the idea that Nikki shot Chris to save her own life and the lives of her children. To support their claims, Nikki's lawyers brought in witnesses, including psychologists, examiners, midwives, and friends, to testify about the extensive abuse she suffered at the hands of Chris over the years. These individuals, having witnessed Nikki's plight, were genuinely concerned for her safety. They consistently advised her to leave Chris and report the violence to law enforcement. Despite their advice, Nikki, scared of Chris, never felt courageous enough to take such steps. 
Next, they also presented photos of injuries and bruises in court, emphasizing that these marks couldn't be self-inflicted by Nikki. They pointed to specific injuries like bite marks on her neck, rope marks on her neck and hands, and bruises from physical violence all over her body. The lingering question persisted. If neither Chris nor Nikki caused these bruises, then who was responsible? It's on her neck, on her back, places that she couldn't reach. How do you know if any of those injuries actually came from Chris and not one of the other individuals that she was claiming she was involved in a relationship with? But Nikki's lawyers weren't buying it. They argued that the other men the prosecution brought up were just a ploy to create confusion and an attempt to shame Nikki by suggesting she was involved with multiple men. According to them, the truth was clear. She had no physical relationship with anyone other than Chris. They believed that it wasn't crucial to focus on whether Chris was victimizing her with intimate partner violence. Instead, they stressed the importance of determining if killing Chris was the right decision or not. They contended that the aggressive texts Nikki sent were typical responses when someone's uncomfortable challenging the prosecution's narrative. They also pointed out to the jurors that all the internet searches on how to kill someone while sleeping were on Chris's phone. There was no proof that Nikki did those searches. Some believe that Chris might be the one who did them, but there was no evidence supporting that idea. The lawyers argued that the medical examiner, Dr. Newman, also testified that there was no proof Chris was actually sleeping. He suggested it could have happened the way Nikki described. Now, to get to the exact truth, they called Nikki herself to the stand so jurors could hear directly from her about what really happened with her. Nikki, who was visibly shaken and in tears, told the court that Chris used to lash out whenever he felt disrespected. She shared that he never cared for her and reiterated her story of abuse, including instances where he beat her, assaulted her, choked her, and left her tied up for hours. She told the jurors that after Fane was born, Chris began watching adult violent content videos constantly and also tried to recreate them with her. Nikki's attorneys also presented photos which were mostly too graphic, but the videos that were recorded were always off camera, and in those videos, only Nikki can be seen tied up, with Chris who was always absent. These videos were uploaded on an adult website featuring violent content and disrespectful language. When it was searched, it was determined that all those videos were uploaded by the username Grover Respect. Strangely, when the jurors saw these photos, they didn't really notice the ugly words or information on the post. Grover Respect described himself as a 29-year-old cinematographer who loved martial arts, much like Chris. However, the judge ruled that there was no way to prove that Chris created Grover Respect and posted these videos on that website. But it didn't end there. In a surprising twist, there was additional evidence in the case that the jurors didn't get to see. This included Nikki's full medical report from 2014, where she talked about the violence she experienced. Also, there were midwife exams noting injuries the summer before Chris passed away, which were kept from public view. It's not uncommon for some evidence to be excluded at a murder trial, but many contended that excluding this evidence was a mistake. Prosecutor Krauss argued that Nikki could be the one who made those explicit videos herself, as there is no way to identify a man in the photos. Krauss believed that bit by bit, Nikki had been creating evidence against Chris, which is why Chris wasn't in any of the evidence. Nikki's nervousness during the trial was also noted by her prosecutors and Chris's mother. She would say one thing, and then in the next breath, she was saying something else. Right on the stand, you could see that it wasn't the truth. After extensive arguments and testimonies in Nikki's case, the opinions remained divided, with some believing Nikki was innocent and others thinking Chris was innocent. Following 14 days of testimony, the case went to the jurors, who had the challenging task of deciding whether Nikki Adamando was a terrified victim or a manipulative liar. After three days of deliberation, a verdict was announced. In April 2019, the jury, consisting of eight women and four men, rejected Nikki's claim of self-defense and convicted her of criminal possession of a weapon and second-degree murder. As a result, she was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison. The jury's decision to convict Nikki, despite her traumatic experiences and potential harm, shocked many people. 
Some believed it resembled a real-life Gone Girl scenario, suggesting Nikki planned everything for years, even inflicting injuries on herself to later justify killing Chris. On the other hand, Chris's family and friends felt a sense of relief, finally hearing that the jury believed Chris was innocent and wasn't responsible for abusing Nikki in any way. And for once, a little bit of relief because they had drugged Christopher's name through the mud so bad and turned him into this monster that he was not. Did you feel vindicated? No, this is never about me. I felt happy for Chris's family. They got to the point where they heard the jury say guilty. Now, if you think the case was finished and that's the end, then hold on, because the case isn't over just yet. Due to an updated New York State law in 2019 called the Domestic Violence Survivors Justice Act, Nikki was entitled to another day in court. A hearing was held in 2020 where her claims of domestic violence played a role in reducing her sentence. This law allowed the judge to consider the defendant's status as a victim and how it contributed to the crime they committed when determining the sentencing. Judge Edward McLaughlin, who was also overseeing Nikki's trial, heard arguments from prosecutors claiming Nikki wasn't a genuine victim. They contended that she had all the access to services and could have left Chris at any time, even on the day he died. However, supporters of Nikki argue that labeling her as not a real victim oversimplified the complex dynamics of domestic violence. Krauss argued that Nikki had a car and the means to leave, emphasizing that she could have done so on the day Chris died. Nikki's defense stressed that leaving was not a straightforward option, as Nikki might have faced severe consequences even if she had left Chris, challenging the common misconception about escaping abusive relationships. Nikki even sought help and support services, but with two young children at home, finding a safe way out proved challenging for her. Even on the night Chris died, Nikki revealed to the police that she pleaded with him at least 17 times to let her go and promised not to tell anyone, but Chris refused to allow her to leave. Nikki's defense argued that leaving an abusive and violent partner wouldn't necessarily guarantee her safety. They emphasized that even if Nikki had left Chris, the risk of harm could persist, making leaving not a guaranteed option for her safety. The defense suggested that escaping a situation of ongoing abuse posed its own set of dangers and challenges for Nikki. In February 2020, the judge leaned towards the prosecution's argument, stating that Nikki was very close to her front door the night Chris died and could have left. The judge also mentioned that Nikki's inconsistent statements about past abuse made it difficult to determine the identity of her abuser. Despite this, many of Nikki's supporters maintained that she was the true victim, emphasizing that all the documented instances of abuse point to Chris as the perpetrator. To uh, porn sites. And so that was a part of the testimony that was not entered into court. And so the jury wasn't allowed to see. I mean, when, when, when people interviewed jurors afterwards, they said, why didn't you believe Nikki's version of the domestic violence? They said they didn't understand why didn't she leave. Nikki's supporters gathered outside the Poughkeepsie courthouse, and this time, though the court didn't overturn her conviction, they did rule in her favor. They decided she deserved a reduced sentence under the Survivor's Justice Act, changing it from 19 years to life to seven and a half years in prison. With five years already served, Nikki's release was scheduled for 2024, and she was released on January 4, 2024, now 35 years old. As Nikki served her time behind bars, her children found a home with relatives, and the Grover family faithfully visited them every other day. The only two people who know about the mystery of what transpired on that fateful night of September 28, 2017, are Nikki and Chris, and sadly, only one of them is alive to tell their side of the story. I was afraid that if I moved forward, nothing would happen, or very little, and then it would be more dangerous when he came back. I stayed as long as I did, trying to keep us all together until I couldn't anymore. Domestic violence can happen to anyone, but speaking up about it is challenging. What do you think? Was Nikki truly a victim in this case? Or was she a manipulative liar, even though she seemingly had everything in life? When the man who abducted a young woman from the streets received a 60-year prison sentence, there was a collective sigh of relief among the community, thinking he was off the streets and no longer a threat for anyone. 
little did they know the darker secrets of his heinous deeds were yet to unfold. The 60-year sentence turned out to be just the tip of the iceberg as he faced more shocking revelations, unraveling a twisted tale that took years to fully reveal. Who was this man, and what were the long-hidden secrets? Texas, the second largest state in the United States, boasts a diverse landscape, rich history, and vibrant culture. From the iconic deserts of West Texas to the bustling urban centers like Houston and Dallas, the state has a lot to offer. However, Texas has also been the backdrop for some notorious crimes. In Texas, Interstate 45 has been a scary place for years. It goes through swamps and the derrick oil fields between Galveston and Houston. This highway's link to many unsolved murders over the years. Deputy Chief Josh Rogers from Texas says that 1997 was a particularly deadly year and especially dangerous along this route with a high number of deadly incidents. But what really happened here? To look into it, we'll begin with the case involving Laura Smither. On April 3, 1997, at around 9 a.m., 12-year-old Laura Smither asked her mother if she could go for a jog alone. Little did her mom know that saying yes to this request would bring her lasting pain. Laura, born to Bob and Gay Smither, had a happy upbringing in the city of Friendswood, Texas, with her younger brother David. She was known for being kind and gentle. Laura was a smart student and a talented ballet dancer. Her dream of becoming a ballerina was starting to come true as she'd recently been accepted into the Houston Ballet Academy. While making breakfast, Laura's mother said it was okay for her to go on a short jog as she'd recently started cardio and was trying hard to improve her ballet. But when Laura didn't come back after a period of time, her parents started to panic. Laura was never out on her own for so long, and since she was always under their watchful eye being a homeschooled child, they sensed something was amiss. Laura's father went out and searched the neighborhood, but there was no trace of her. Now, getting more worried, they also called relatives and her friends to check if anyone had seen her, but got no answers. With Laura nowhere to be found, they decided to call the Friendswood police and report her as missing. As the police began looking into it, folks from the community rallied around Laura's family, joining forces to help in the search. She's a beautiful child. She is loving, she's kind, she's sensitive, she's very intelligent. Um, very responsible. very responsible. I just pray for her and I pray for her family and I pray she comes back okay. And my kids, I never, I'm not letting them out of my sight, ever. They made flyers with Laura's picture and went around asking everyone in the area if they knew anything about the missing girl. Laura's parents were deeply touched by the community's support and their love for Laura. Friendswood has been just uh, amazing. Uh, we've had many, many people come by and they're putting flyers out in all the stores and, and every place yeah. that they can think of. The community loves her very much. She's a very special girl. No one is giving up hope. Everyone no, she's coming back to us. She's coming back to us. The next morning, the police were out looking for the little girl. Some officers searched through the woods on foot, and helicopters were used to search from the skies, but they didn't find any clues. Despite this, the community stayed strong, with hundreds of volunteers who joined Laura's family to search for the 12-year-old. About 6,000 volunteers participated in the week-long campaign, and instead of losing steam, each day brought more volunteers and improved tracking methods, like using an infrared camera to find clues. A search and rescue team with specially trained dogs even came from Dallas to help. These dogs, with an amazing sense of smell, spent the whole day sniffing around Laura's home, picking up scents from as far as 800 yards away. We were testing timelines uh, along roadways where, where they, might have, uh, they might have traveled. There's still optimism. We're going to bring Laura home safe. Uh, we're, we're just going to keep the pressure on and it's going to happen. The police were working hard and even the National Coast Guard and FBI joined the local police to help in the search for Laura. While they initially thought she might be lost in the woods, as the investigation went on, they started to suspect foul play. To keep the search going, the community organized candlelight rallies and vigils in Laura's name. For a community to come this close together for something, we don't, I don't even know the little girl. And I've lived in Friendswood for 30 years, uh, 20 years, sorry, and I, I don't even know her. But um, I know if something would happen to my kids, I would want somebody to help me. And when we first 
Another week went by with no progress in Laura's case. On Sunday, April 20th, 1997, the community gathered at Friendswood High School to discuss what to do next. During the meeting, the police chief got a phone call. The worried look on his face made people fear the worst, but they didn't know what had happened. Around 10 p.m. that day, Laura's parents were informed about the horrifying discovery. Earlier that day, a father and son walking their dog found the badly decomposed body of a young girl in a muddy area near a pond in Pasadena, just 12 miles from where Laura disappeared. The girl had only a pair of socks on, and the police suspected it was Laura. The autopsy later confirmed their fears. 17 days after she disappeared, Laura was found, but it was a heartbreaking discovery. Because Laura had been in the water for weeks, the exact cause of her death couldn't be determined, and investigators weren't sure if she'd been physically assaulted. The whole Friendswood area was shocked and heartbroken about the tragic loss of this little girl. Alongside the sadness, there was also a lot of fear. People were worried that a dangerous person might be out there looking for more victims. In an urgent effort to find leads, the police started questioning sex offenders in the area. Even with many unknowns, a suspect came into focus quite soon. This person had been released just six months before Laura's murder after serving 10 years in an Oklahoma prison for two physical assaults. He was working in Windsor Estate in Friendswood as an equipment operator when Laura went missing. Strangely, on that day, he left work around the same time Laura disappeared and returned 30 minutes later. When the investigators checked his truck, they discovered fibers from his replacement floor mats that matched fibers on Laura's socks. Even as the police kept looking for stronger evidence against him, the man stayed free, moving between Houston, where he worked, and Oklahoma, where his mother lived. However, not much time had passed when, just two months later on July 15, 1997, in Denton, Texas, a university town along the same stretch of interstate, 20-year-old Kelly Cox disappeared. She was a pretty, pretty amazing young lady. She was very focused, had a plan. Kelly would usually spend her mornings studying at the University of North Texas and the rest of her days being a mother to her daughter Alexis. On July 15th, just like any other day, Kelly got everything ready for her daughter, packing her bag with necessary things before they hurried out the door. I said, well, I love you, honey. Have a good day. I'll talk to you this afternoon. Those were my last words. Kelly dropped her 19-month-old daughter, Alexis, with a babysitter and went on a field trip to a Denton jail for her criminology class with her classmates. She parked her car across from the police station, and to be safe, she hid a spare key in a magnetic box under her car. After locking up her things, including her phone, in the car as her professor advised, Kelly took a tour of the jail. She left promptly after the tour ended around noon because she had a test at the university. Strangely, when she tried to leave, her spare key didn't work on her car door, even though she'd checked it the night before. The key that had been working hours earlier had now mysteriously stopped working. Since Kelly couldn't access her cell phone, which was locked in the car, she walked to a nearby gas station and used a payphone to call her boyfriend, Lawrence Harris, for assistance. She requested him to bring another key because the one she had suddenly stopped working. After the call, she went inside the gas station to have a drink. When Lawrence got there about 45 minutes later, Kelly's car was still in the parking lot, but she was gone. The key box and the key were also nowhere to be found. After searching for Kelly for a while, Lawrence got worried and called Kelly's mother to check if she'd made it home, but she hadn't. Even though the situation was already raising eyebrows, Kelly's family gave it some time, hoping she'd come back. But by 5.30 p.m. that afternoon, they knew something was off. Kelly was supposed to pick up her 19-month-old daughter, Alexis, from the babysitter's house at 5.30, but she didn't show up. This was when people really started to worry, because Kelly, despite being young, was known for being a responsible mother. It seemed unlikely that she'd neglect to pick up Alexis or fail to make alternative arrangements for her if needed. Once the missing person's report was filed, investigators promptly began searching for the young mother. Their first step was questioning everyone close to Kelly to gather information. We're going to look at anyone that, that she may be seeing, any close friends that she spends time with, and uh, her boyfriend was one of those. But after passing four polygraph tests, Lawrence was ruled out as a suspect. Shockingly, it was a twist of events when investigators followed a tip that led them to another person, a man who'd been a suspect in Laura Smithers' case. Even though he didn't live in Denton, a gas station receipt placed him there on the day Kelly disappeared. As a sex offender, he became a priority suspect, and the police searched his car for Kelly's fingerprints. Strangely, they found none, leaving them with no further evidence to connect him to the disappearance. 
It was a mystery why this man, even though suspected, managed to slip away each time. Who was he, and what was his story? Without answering any of the questions, soon the case went cold with no leads, witnesses, or surveillance footage. For many years, Kelly's mother felt a deep sadness each time a body was found along the infamous highway in Texas. She held on to hope that one day Kelly would come back home, but sadly, that day never arrived. Every single day you ask that question, is today the day that she's going to come through the door, she's going to call on the phone, or the police department's going to call? And we have answered. Kelly's disappearance was tough on her mother and stepfather, especially as they had to raise little Alexis on their own. But the hardest part was making young Alexis understand that her mother wasn't likely to return to give her warmth and motherly love. She drew pictures of, of Kelly. And she said, Nana, here's pictures. I drew pictures for posters to go up on in the park to look for Mommy. And it was... I mean, when I look at those pictures, it just brings tears to my eyes. I would just tell her I love her and I miss her. Despite the passing years, Kelly never returned to her daughter. Following her mother's path, Alexis went to the same university as Kelly had, holding on to the hope that her mother might come back one day. Throughout all those years, Kelly's family never gave up hope. They kept sharing her story and never stopped putting her picture everywhere she could. But sadly, even after numerous efforts, Kelly never made it home. However, the shocks weren't going to end, as just 11 days after Kelly went missing in Oklahoma, another young woman was about to disappear. On June 26, 1997, around midnight, a patrol officer from the Bethany Police Department saw a white neon Dodge left at a car wash. Initially, it didn't seem unusual to the officer, but when he came back later and saw the car still there, he got suspicious. While walking up to the car, he noticed that the key was still in the ignition, and the car door was open. He quickly sent the license plate number to headquarters and learned that the car belonged to 17-year-old Tiffany Johnson. When the officer checked inside, he found Tiffany's purse, and in the glove box, he discovered a phone number that belonged to Tiffany's mother, Kathy, who lived in Anadarko, 60 miles away from Bethany. I received a call from the Bethany Police Department wanting to know if Tiffany was with me. I told them, no, she was supposed to meet her new husband, Ryan. So now the investigators made their next call to Ryan, Tiffany's husband, who was just as clueless about his wife's whereabouts. It was becoming clear that something wasn't right. He shared with the officer that Tiffany left the restaurant where she worked part-time around 2 p.m. that day as she was excited about celebrating their third month anniversary. But she was only supposed to meet him at 11 p.m., so on her way home, Tiffany stopped by the Sunshine Car Wash to clean up her white neon Dodge. However, when Ryan was supposed to meet her later that night, he couldn't find any signs of her, and she wasn't at home either. Being worried and tense, he first considered contacting the police, but then decided to wait a bit longer in hopes that Tiffany would return on her own. But even before the police had a chance to search for Tiffany, they received heartbreaking news. Just a day after she went missing, on July 27, 1997, near I-40 in Gregory Road, Searchers looking for another missing girl stumbled upon the lifeless body of a young Caucasian woman. When the police arrived, they were already thinking it might be Tiffany, and their suspicions were confirmed when Ryan saw her pictures and quickly identified her as his wife. Sadly, she was found with only a swimsuit on, and all of her other clothes were taken off. While the autopsy couldn't pinpoint the exact time of her death, it indicated that she'd been physically assaulted and strangled. They even found unknown DNA on her body, which they collected and kept as evidence. With such a case, anyone could be a suspect, and their suspicion landed on someone very close to Tiffany. So in this case, we had a dead wife. Uh, now we have a living husband, and oftentimes uh, the husband is responsible for the death of the wife. However, it didn't take long to find out that Tiffany was last seen at the car wash at 6 p.m., and during that time, Ryan was at work, and he'd been there from 3 p.m. to 11 p.m., so, looking at the timeline, the police realized that it didn't make sense that Tiffany was abducted from the car wash because it was busy. And if someone had tried to take her by force, there likely would have been a big struggle. But the area where a car was found didn't show any signs of a struggle, and even the car was unlocked. Nothing seemed disturbed around that spot. 
This made the police think about the possibility that Tiffany might have willingly gotten into the car with someone she knew and left with them. While the investigation was still going on a few days later, Tiffany's mother, Kathy, received a phone call from a man named William Reese, someone she knew from her town of Anadarko. While they hadn't met in person, William's mother was good friends with Tiffany's mother. He called Kathy shortly after Tiffany's death to express condolences, but she was unaware of hidden secrets. However, as time passed, there was still no progress in the investigation, and the case eventually ended up in the cold case files. With the continuing murders of women in the area, the whole community was questioning when this game of horror would end. Just three weeks after Tiffany's murder, another tragedy struck Lamar, Texas. Born on August 28, 1979, Jessica Kane brought joy to her parents, C.H. and Susie Kane. With a passion for sports, she served as the drill team captain at O'Connell High School in Galveston, Texas. On August 16, 1997, after performing in a musical review in Dickinson and attending a cast party at Bennigan's on Bay Area Boulevard, Jessica didn't return home after a night out with friends. Not finding her at home the next morning, in a panic, Jessica's mother urgently woke up her father and they started trying to reach Jessica. Despite their efforts, they couldn't get hold of her, so they reached out to several friends who were with Jessica the night before. All of them shared the same story. Jessica left the party around 1.30 a.m., and after that, no one had heard from her. Jessica's parents got worried, especially when her father found her car parked by the freeway near the Lamarck exit. Her belongings were still inside, but Jessica was nowhere to be seen. Being extremely worried, he immediately called the police to report her missing. Once again, search parties scoured the area for another missing girl. With over 100 volunteers exploring on foot among the marshes and through the brush, during this challenging time, Jessica's parents found solace in connecting with two individuals who understood their pain, Bob and Gay Smither, Laura Smither's parents. The Smithers, despite reliving their own nightmare, stood strong in supporting Jessica's parents and actively participated in the search efforts. They shared the concern of whether the person responsible for Jessica's disappearance was the same one who took their own daughter's life. Despite extensive searches by law enforcement in the community, no signs of Jessica emerged. Police began to entertain the possibility of foul play and expressed a grim belief that finding Jessica alive was unlikely. However, amidst the ongoing search, a new story surfaced about another case where the victim had managed to survive. Back on May 16, 1997, three months before Jessica went missing, 19-year-old mother Sandra Sapha had a disturbing encounter. She stopped at a convenience store in Webster, Texas, off I-45, and noticed a man staring at her in the parking lot. Later, at a Waffle House across the street, she saw the same man again. He followed her to the store and asked if she needed some help because her tires were flat. Suddenly, he pulled out a knife and forcibly took Sandra into his white pickup truck. Inside the truck, the man overpowered her and tied her wrists before driving along Interstate 45. Being terrified, Sandra discovered that the truck door was unlocked, in a desperate move to escape, she broke free from the restraints and jumped out of the moving truck, but suffered serious injuries during her escape. She was later taken to a nearby hospital, where the police were contacted and the incident was reported. Five months later, in October 1997, during a meeting with Friendswood Police, Webster investigators realized that Sandra's description of her abductor's pickup matched a truck they had searched in Laura's case. On October 16, 1997, when a lineup was conducted, Sandra swiftly identified the man who had abducted her, and he was none other than William Reese. The question arose, who was he? And was he the same suspect back in April 1997 in Laura's case? William Lewis Reese was born on July 1, 1959 in Oklahoma, and he grew up in Yukon and Anadarko. He was one of 13 siblings. Because of his family's financial struggles, he had to stop going to school in the ninth grade and started working as a farm laborer. He was married twice, but both marriages didn't last long. In April 1986, William kidnapped a 19-year-old daughter of a Texas sheriff's deputy for which he got arrested and charged, but was released after paying bail. Just a month later, while out on bond, he physically assaulted another woman, leading to another arrest. He faced trial for both crimes, was found guilty, and received a 25-year prison sentence. However, he appealed his conviction, and a criminal court reviewed his case. They found some procedural errors, which led to a reduction in his 25-year sentence. 
He was granted parole in October 1996 after serving around nine and a half years. This release happened just six months before Laura's disappearance. After leaving prison, William moved in to his mother's home in Anadarko, Oklahoma. Coming back to the case, William was promptly arrested in October 1997 and charged with kidnapping Sarah Sapow. He pleaded not guilty and ended up behind bars, but was still not connected to the murders of the other girls. Despite his denial of kidnapping Sarah and slashing her tires, investigators were determined to connect him to Laura's murder. Deputy Chief Josh Rogers mentioned that he found a potential link during a search of William's apartment. They discovered a multicolored horse blanket, and many of those colors matched the ones found on one of Laura's socks. Even though they had fibers from Laura's socks matching William's floor mats, the DA at the time wasn't convinced it was sufficient evidence to charge him with Laura's murder. But Friendswood detectives weren't giving up. They dug into records to track William's movements the previous summer and finally uncovered some potential connections to other unsolved cases as they refused to give up on solving the mysteries of those murders. It got more interesting when the investigators discovered a fuel bill in Denton on July 15th the same place and date as Kelly Cox's disappearance. This was the first time Kelly's mother, Jan, had heard about William, and now Denton police had him on their radar too. Throughout their investigation, they also uncovered some records which indicated that William used a payphone in the town where Tiffany's body was found less than an hour after she disappeared. Moreover, the owner of the car wash, upon seeing his picture, confirmed that William was a frequent customer. This new evidence made William the prime suspect in Tiffany's case as well. The jury quickly reached a guilty verdict, and William was convicted in 1998 and received a 60-year sentence for kidnapping Sandra. After a year, finally the community felt a sense of relief knowing William was behind bars. But Laura's case, as well as Tiffany's, Kelly and Jessica's cases, still officially remained unsolved. While up in Oklahoma, Kathy, Tiffany's mother, never gave up pushing investigators to solve Tiffany's murder. It was after more than a decade when Kathy's persistent calls were finally answered. In 2012, retired police chief Lynn Williams joined the efforts to crack cold cases at the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, and he took on the task of investigating Tiffany's case. Inside the evidence box, Lynn found DNA evidence from Tiffany's body, which was carefully preserved over the years. Despite two unsuccessful tests, Wendy Duke, the supervising criminologist at the OSBI cold case unit, discovered two samples from Tiffany's body that hadn't been fully used in earlier testing. Miraculously, she managed to develop a partial male profile from these samples. Duke sifted through the known profiles to find a match, and as the team eliminated suspects one by one, they arrived at a shocking discovery. The man who was behind Tiffany's murder was none other than William Reese, a person who was connected to Tiffany's family and who had called to express grief over her death. This revelation led the Oklahoma DA to believe that there was sufficient evidence to charge William for Tiffany's murder. After enduring years of waiting, Kathy finally found some relief as justice seemed within reach. Oklahoma law enforcement shared the breakthrough with Texas investigators, including the Texas Rangers, who were eager to explore if William Reese would cooperate in solving their cases. They visited William in prison, and surprisingly, he agreed to talk further, but with a condition. The death penalty had to be taken off the table. In exchange for his cooperation in solving the cases, authorities agreed to this condition. In February 2016, William Reese was moved from prison to Friendswood Jail after agreeing to provide information about three Texas cases. Authorities also took him to a remote field south of Friendswood where he claimed Kelly Cox's remains were located. Police spent extensive time with William, both in jail and out in the field, searching for Kelly's remains. During this period, he began sharing details with investigators about his encounter with Kelly and Denton. He claimed they got into a fight in a gas station parking lot after he accidentally bumped into her, causing her to spill her soda on him. When she never woke up. Okay, where did you go from there? Come back to Houston. And she was stayed in the back? The whole back time. time. Cause I was trying to figure out what the hell am I doing, man? This, this, everything keeps going downhill. Keeps going downhill. I drove out there off of 288 and stayed out there all night. Trying to figure out what the hell am I going to do, man? What, what am I doing? Things keep getting worse and worse. 
had a dozer out there and, and I dug me a little old hole and put her in it. During the interview, William confessed to killing Kelly, but there was another shocking revelation. He also told investigators what happened to Laura on that rainy morning in Friendswood. William claimed that Laura died instantly after he accidentally hit her with his truck. However, he later changed his story, saying that Laura actually survived. According to him, when he tried to stop her from crying, he accidentally broke her neck. And when I got out of the truck, there was a little girl down in the ditch, and she was crying and, crying and yelling. So I go down in the ditch, I'm panicking, and uh, I try and get her to quit screaming. And I put my hand over her mouth, and she was facing away from me. So when I turned her head around, I felt her neck pop, and she got real quiet. And I picked her up, I put her in the truck because I was panicking. I didn't know what to do. And uh, I took her out to this detention pond. She was already dead, and I took her clothes off and put her in the water. Examining William's inconsistent statements and behavior, Myra Lino, a retired FBI profiler, suggested that he exhibited traits of psychopathy. She believed that William enjoyed the attention from law enforcement and the disruption to his routine. While the search for remains was ongoing, William continued to confess to every murder, providing details about Jessica and Tiffany's cases and how he buried their bodies at different locations. I keep thinking I put my hands around her throat and started choking her, but I, I can't remember. Okay. And then I know she was out, help out. I just picked her up and put her in the Jeep, put the seatbelt on her, shut the door, walked around, got in my Jeep and took off. In March 2016, after 25 days of determined digging guided by William, there was a breakthrough. Jessica's remains were discovered at a site in Houston Pasture, but her parents requested privacy to process the news and lay their daughter to rest. The discovery of Jessica's remains boosted the credibility of William's statements, and with renewed determination, the search for Kelly continued. It was after two more weeks of painstaking effort, they successfully located Kelly's remains at a burial site in Brazoria County. It was the most painful moment for the families who were still holding hope that maybe their daughters would come back alive. In July 2016, Reese was extradited from Texas to Oklahoma to stand trial for the murder of Johnson. The trial began on April 21, 2017. Reese's defense team filed a motion for change of venue due to asbestos in the courthouse. An independent examination concluded that the building's condition was hazardous and the trial adjourned until June 2019. In the meantime, prosecutors from Texas announced that they would extradite him to their state to stand trial for the murder of Laura, Kelly, and Jessica after the end of his Oklahoma trial. After Tiffany's trial was indefinitely postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it resumed in May 2021 in the Oklahoma County District Court, and the jury found him guilty on May 28, 2021. The judge didn't mince words, and on August 19, 2021, sentenced him to death for the abduction and murder of Tiffany. Even after William's deal with law enforcement, he received the death sentence because he gave partially false information in his confession and failed to disclose both his true motives for the crime and the accurate details. After being convicted in Oklahoma, William faced another trial in Texas in March 2022 for the murders of Laura Smither, Kelly Cox, and Jessica Kane. It wasn't a surprise that he pleaded guilty to all three murders and the judge delivered the final blow, sentencing him to life imprisonment in June 2022. Justice finally caught up with them for the devastating crimes that he committed against these innocent lives. For years, four families yearned for answers about their missing loved ones, enduring the anguish of uncertainty. The person behind these crimes callously hoarded these secrets and revealed them only when it suited his own motives. It's disheartening to witness such selfishness. Now we can only hope that the families, armed with the truth, can embark on the path of healing. Providing their loved ones with a long overdue proper burial might offer some solace after enduring the pain for so many years. This surveillance video captures the last moment 16-year-old Susana Morales was seen July 26th. She was walking home near Singleton Road and Indian Trail Lilburn Road after visiting a friend. July 26, 2022 was a typical summer day for the Morales family. At around 6 p.m., 16-year-old Susanna strolled out of her house to visit a friend who lived just a short 10-minute walk away. Everything appeared quite ordinary, and Susanna even texted her mom, Maria, around 10 p.m. to inform her that she'd be coming back home in a few minutes. However, things took a dark turn when the next morning arrived, and Susanna was nowhere to be found. 
the investigation is still ongoing and if there's further charges in the future, those will be known. As of right now, it's still early in. Even reporting her as missing also became a challenging task. Despite the determined efforts of her family and the community, Susanna never came back home. In retracing Susanna's steps and analyzing her phone location data, a chilling clue emerged in the form of surveillance footage showing Susanna just one minute from her home. Sadly, instead of providing answers, the footage only intensified the mystery. What transpired within a mere one minute span? This case has unexpected twists and turns that will keep you gripped until the end. The truth behind Susanna's disappearance may be more elusive than you think. Susanna Morales was born on June 24, 2006 to a Hispanic family. She had a tight-knit family living with her mom, Maria, and stepdad, Leo. She was the youngest of the family and had two older sisters, Jasmine and Jalisa. Plus, she had a stepbrother she adored. Her best friend was her sister, Jasmine. They were as close as could be, sharing all their secrets and hanging out all the time. The summer of 2022 saw Susanna in Norcross, Georgia as a high school freshman at Meadow Creek High School. She was a great cheerleader and was highly admired by her classmates. Susanna had a sweet and caring personality. People adored her for how she treated everyone with kindness. She also had some amazing musical talents up her sleeve. She had a magical voice and taught herself to play the guitar and ukulele. But that's not all. She was a real people person hanging out with her friends and, of course, her tight-knit family. They did it all together, from going out to watching movies and planning awesome picnics, everything that could bring them closer. But sadly, the happy days for Susanna wouldn't last forever. July 26, 2022 was just a regular day for the Morales family. Summer was in full swing, so Susanna was on school break, but school reopening was also imminent. In fact, she and her mom, Maria, had plans to go shopping for school supplies the next day. So around 4 p.m., Susanna came back home after a day out with her mom. She was looking for ways to make some extra cash, especially before school started up again. For Susanna, it was all about working hard and looking forward to the school year ahead. Once they got back home, they took a breather after a long day's work. Around 6 p.m., Susanna told her mom that she was going to visit a friend. This friend, whose name was kept undisclosed for privacy reasons, lived close to the Morales house, just a quick six to ten minute walk away. In fact, the friend's residence, Sterling Glen Apartments, was located just 0.9 miles from Susanna's house on Santa Ana Drive. They were tight pals, and Susanna often hung out there. The Morales family wasn't worried, as Susanna had walked that route many times. After Maria gave the green light, Susanna stepped out in her comfy blue jeans, a sunny yellow tank top, and white Crocs at around 6 p.m. About six minutes later, Maria texted Susanna, making sure she'd made it. Susanna texted back, saying she was spending time at her friend's house and would head home later that night. It all seemed pretty normal, but what was about to come would become an unforgettable nightmare for the Morales family. Susanna hung out at her friend's place for a few hours, and a little before 10 p.m., she messaged her mom, saying she was heading back home. Soon, 10 minutes had passed, but Susanna still hadn't shown up at home. That got Maria a little worried, so she thought she should check if everything was okay or if her daughter needed a ride back. Maria wanted to know what was going on, so she tried calling her daughter, but Susanna didn't answer the phone. The hours kept ticking away, and there was still no sign of Susanna. At this point, the whole family was concerned, but they started thinking that maybe Susanna had decided to crash at her friend's place for the night, and they wondered if her phone had run out of battery or if she could have forgotten to give them a heads up. So they decided to wait till the next morning, thinking Susanna would come back on her own. But the morning rolled in, and there was still no sign of Susanna. That's when they got really worried. So the following morning, on July 27, 2022, the family decided to reach out to the police. At around 9 a.m., Maria called the Gwinnett County Police Department, as it had already been almost 12 hours since anyone had seen or heard from Susanna. But here's where things got really frustrating. The police brushed off their concerns and said they had to wait for 48 hours before they could officially consider Susanna missing. Their reasoning for this was that teenagers, especially girls, 
sometimes run off with their boyfriends or go to parties. But Susanna's family knew she wasn't that kind of teenager. They knew in their hearts that she wouldn't just run away without a word. She was responsible and would always make sure her family knew she was okay and safe. Besides, she didn't even grab any of her personal stuff. No clothes, no shoes, no cash. She'd only taken her purse with a little money, her makeup, and her phone. It was totally out of character for Susanna, as she'd never done anything like this before. Susanna's family had this strong feeling that something wasn't right. They kept telling the police over and over that she hadn't run away and kept requesting them to start looking for her. But the police just wouldn't budge. They told the family that there wasn't any proof of a crime occurring, no sign of an abduction, no one was hurt, and Susanna wasn't in danger. But the police didn't even want to alert the community to the fact that Susanna was missing and that they should keep an eye out for her. What made things even more unsettling was that the initial 48 hours are crucial in cases like this. Naturally, Susanna's family was extremely frustrated. However, they were not going to sit around and just wait for those crucial 48 hours to pass. With no police help, they took matters into their own hands and launched their very own search to bring Susanna home. The family hit the neighborhood streets, handing out flyers and asking everyone if they spotted Susanna on the night she disappeared. They also showed everyone a picture of her in her light blue jeans, yellow tank top, and white Crocs, urging them to dig into their memories and recall if they'd seen her walking around or anything out of the ordinary which could help find Susanna. They even reached out online for help. And luckily, a neighbor stepped up with a critical piece of information. He mentioned that he had a security camera outside his house and it had captured Susanna on the night she disappeared. When the family saw the footage, it showed Susanna walking back toward her neighborhood after 10 p.m. What was intriguing was that this spot was less than a minute from her home. Jasmine, Susanna's sister, had a strong feeling that something must have gone wrong in that one minute. It's frustration of not knowing where she is, not knowing anything, you know? Like, all I ask sometimes is just, I just want to know where she's at so I can get her. Something happened in between the place that we got the camera footage from and our neighborhood, and that's like a minute apart. So something happened in that little minute, and just, we just haven't been able to figure out what happened. The security footage left no room for doubt that Susanna was all alone, on her way back, carrying her phone, and there was zero sign of her trying to run away. For Susanna's family, this was clear proof that she had every intention of returning back. They brought this convincing evidence back to the police, hoping that now, finally, they'd get some help. But shockingly, the police still hesitated to assist the Morales family. It was like the police couldn't see the urgency, and they tried to downplay the whole case, even though Susanna's family had solid evidence that she wasn't some rebellious teen running away. Their refusal to help and their reluctance to inform the public that Susanna was missing left the family truly broken and infuriated. They were only asking for some basic assistance and a public notice, but it felt like an uphill battle. Finally, under intense pressure from the family, the police started taking action. They decided to check Susanna's phone records, hoping for a ping that would give them a clue about where she was last seen. This information was crucial in piecing together a timeline of her movements. When they checked her phone records, it turned out that on the night of her disappearance, Susanna was walking along Singleton Road between 10.07 p.m. and 10.21 p.m. Then between 10.21 p.m. and 10.26 p.m., the location data on her phone suggested she was around Oak Brook Terrace near Steve Reynolds Boulevard. But after that point, it seemed like her phone either ran out of battery or was intentionally turned off because there was no more information about Susanna's whereabouts. Now, the police had their own theories explaining this, but they didn't make much sense. They believe that between 10.21 and 10.26 p.m., Susanna could have hopped into a vehicle willingly and ended up at Oak Brook Terrace near Steve Reynolds Boulevard, which was quite far away from the Morales house. But Susanna's family weren't ready to accept this theory. Why would Susanna, who was clearly on her way home, suddenly decide to take a vehicle to a place so far away, especially late at night and without telling her family? Susanna's phone location consistently indicated her presence on the route back to her home, and even the security video didn't show her turning back or getting into any vehicle. So her taking off to another location in a vehicle voluntarily seemed highly unlikely. Susanna's family knew her well, and this just wasn't like her. They were convinced that something horrible had occurred. 
Unfortunately, even with this crucial evidence, the case seemed to be stuck in slow motion. There were no press statements, no significant progress in the investigation, and it felt like the police weren't really putting in any effort to find Susanna. It left everyone with a furious question. Why wasn't Susanna's disappearance a top priority for the police? Although police were still stuck on the idea that Susanna might be a runaway, there were some concerning questions. Most importantly, could a teenager be on the run for so long without any of her belongings? Susanna's family was doing everything in their power to find her. In the month following her disappearance, they put in tireless efforts to keep her name in the spotlight within their community and followed every lead, even though they all turned out to be dead ends. The family even reached out to news stations to talk about Susanna, desperate to spread the word and keep the case from losing momentum. Jasmine was doing TV interviews, talking about her sister. But it was Maria's conversation with Telemundo Atlanta about the night Susanna disappeared that brought some hope for the family. Now, Telemundo Atlanta played a crucial role in this quest to find Susanna and offered strong support to the Morales family. Marie even mentioned feeling discriminated against by the Gwinnett County Police Department, possibly due to a language barrier, as they were a mainly Spanish-speaking family. Telemundo Atlanta stepped up to be their voice and really helped the Morales family spread the word. There was a specific reporter, Alexandra Martinez, who did an exceptional job, putting in a lot of effort to make sure the community knew about the case and to add pressure on the police. Alexandra kept emailing the Gwinnett County Police Department, pushing for updates in the investigation. Most importantly, she asked the one question that was on everyone's mind. Why had the police still not released a statement about Susana Morales? Public pressure was the key to getting the police to take the actions needed, and Telemundo Atlanta was leaving no stone unturned to show the police that they wouldn't let this story fade away. When the community and the public learned about the police's negligence, they started talking about it on social media and TV, forcing the police to realize they needed to solve this case. Thankfully, the pressure actually worked and the police finally sprang into action, possibly due to the fear of facing public scrutiny. About a month after Susanna's disappearance, on August 29, 2022, the police finally released a press statement about her case. This was the very first time they publicly acknowledged that Susanna was missing and reached out to the public for help. But strangely, they added that while any missing young person is seen as endangered, they didn't believe Susanna was in specific danger nor did they think she was being held against her will. The community wondered why the fact that a 16-year-old girl who'd been missing for over a month wasn't considered a major red flag for the police. Even if it seemed somewhat common for teenagers to turn off their phones for a night out, it was really unusual for Susanna to keep her phone off for such an extended period of time. Most teenagers would have turned on their phones to talk to someone, check social media, or stay updated. Her prolonged silence was deeply concerning. Jasmine felt immense gratitude for the community's support. They were sharing Susanna's case on Facebook, Twitter, and retweeting it, spreading the word far and wide. And then, after the police statement, Crime Stoppers Atlanta also stepped in, offering a $2,000 reward for any info that could help bring Susanna back safely. The police were at last making efforts to pursue leads and tips that were brought to their attention and her family was doing the same. Whenever a tip came in, no matter the place, the Morales family didn't hesitate to jump in the car and drive to the location, holding on to hope that they might reunite with Susanna. Jasmine, in particular, was relentless in her efforts. She traveled out of state and organized rallies, all in her determined quest to discover her sister's whereabouts. Jasmine also kept a close watch on Susanna's Instagram and TikTok, hoping for any sign of activity, but it remained eerily silent. Her family and friends joined forces, organizing walks while holding up posters, urging anyone who spotted someone resembling Susanna to take a picture and send it to them or the police immediately. Even as months passed with no word from Susanna, the police still clung to the idea that she might have run away, believing nothing bad had happened to her. A police spokesperson also stepped forward and assured the public that regardless of whether a missing person is considered a runaway or not, detectives would diligently follow up on every case and investigate every lead. However, despite press releases, rallies, TV interviews, and community efforts, 
the case had no significant progress. Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, they all came and went, and still there was no word from Susanna. The police also didn't release any more information during this time, leaving everyone in a state of worry and uncertainty. It wasn't until January 2023 that the police finally reached out to Susanna's family for more information about her case. Strangely, they also requested a DNA sample from Susanna and her mother Maria's dental records. This raised concerns within the family, leading them to wonder why the police would ask for such information. It seemed as if they were considering the possibility that Susanna might already be deceased and that they'd need this data for confirmation in the future. The family couldn't help but feel nervous about the shift in focus from a missing person to the search for a dead body. During one of the interviews with Telemundo Atlanta, Maria opened up about her feelings of loneliness and frustration. She shared her experiences of traveling to South Carolina to follow up on a lead, and her emotional words were truly heart-wrenching to hear. She told the reporter how she found herself torn between searching for leads in her daughter's case and her work obligations. Her boss was calling her to return to her job in Georgia, but Maria was desperately trying to convey that she'd received a crucial lead in her daughter's investigation. She felt compelled to follow this lead, but her boss insisted that her primary responsibilities belonged to the company. Maria couldn't hold back her tears anymore during the interview because she felt an overwhelming fear. Maria knew she was risking her career to follow an uncertain lead, but she was ready if it meant reuniting with her daughter. Her heart was with Susanna, and all she could think about was what had happened to Susanna, whether she'd been taken somewhere, kidnapped, or left in a dangerous situation. Was she even alive or not? It was in February 2023 when she finally received an answer, although it was far from the one she'd hoped for, a twist that would change the entire course of the story. Around 6.30 p.m. on February 6, 2023, a driver traveling on Highway 316 between Downing Creek and Barrow County stopped on the road to take a phone call. As he spoke on the phone and walked into a nearby wooded area, he stumbled upon something disturbing. As he drew closer, shock set in as he realized that what he'd found were actually human remains. The discovery of the remains was a devastating turning point in the case. The driver who found them immediately called the police, and upon their arrival, the crime scene was quickly cordoned off and the remains were taken to the Gwinnett County Medical Examiner's Office. It was there upon further testing that the medical examiner made a grim but crucial confirmation. The human remains belonged to none other than 16-year-old Susanna Morales. The identification was made through the DNA sample and dental records that had been provided by her family. This wasn't the news anyone expected. Instead of welcoming Susanna home safely, the family had come to terms with the heartbreaking reality that she tragically lost her life. The thought that her lifeless body had been left in that secluded wooded area for so long shattered their hearts. It was made even more painful by the fact that they'd spent months pleading for this case to be taken seriously, knowing deep down that something terrible had happened, yet their pleas had gone unanswered. While it was the most devastating news, it also brought a sense of relief to the family, because, finally, they knew where Susanna was and what had happened to her. This gave them the opportunity to bring her home, offer her a proper burial, and the resting place she deserved, to create a place where they could visit her, remember her, and talk to her. The Morales family also set up a GoFundMe campaign to help cover the cost of the funeral, and with the incredible support of the community, they were able to raise over $23,000 to honor Susanna's memory. After finding Susanna's body, the disturbing question on everyone's mind was who could have done this to the 16-year-old girl and why? In their quest for answers, the police decided to retrace the events of the night Susanna disappeared once again. After a thorough review of the timeline, they concluded that Susanna met her tragic fate on the very night she vanished, and when the family had reported her missing at 9 a.m. on July 27th, Susanna was probably already dead. Now, to start the investigation into Susanna's murder, they decided to return to the wooded area where her body had been discovered. Their hope was to find clues that could unravel the mystery of what had befallen Susanna on that fateful night and how she ended up in that location. In a twist that deepened the mystery, they stumbled upon a firearm near Susanna's remains. 
but oddly, there is no gunshot wound found on her body. When they checked the serial number of the weapon in their system, it pointed to a 22-year-old named Miles Bryant. This was not just another turn in the case. Rather, it was a twist no one could have ever expected. As it turned out, Miles Bryant was a police officer working for the Doraville Police Department. So now the police decided to take a deeper dive into Bryant's background, and what they uncovered raised some serious questions. It turned out that Bryant had served as a sworn sheriff's deputy in Forsyth County from March 2020 to May 2021. Then, just a few months later, in September 2021, he embarked on a new career at the Doraville Police Department, where he was employed until the day Susanna's body was discovered. This discovery left law enforcement puzzled because finding a gun associated with a police officer near Susanna's body seemed too much of a coincidence to be ignored. Determined to uncover the truth, authorities started looking into Bryant's actions. What they found raised some eyebrows. It turned out that Bryant had reported his gun as stolen on the very day Susanna was reported missing. In his report, he explained that he accidentally left his truck door unlocked, providing an opportunity for someone to enter and make off with his gun, military ID, and wallet, which contained all his debit and credit cards. What puzzled the investigators was the timing. Bryant filed this report at 11 a.m. on July 27, 2022, a mere two hours after Susanna's family reported her missing. And this wasn't all. Bryant was also a resident in the same apartment complex as Susanna's friend, the very same friend Susanna visited on the fateful night of July 26, 2022 at the Sterling Glen Apartments. But it didn't stop there, as Bryant was more than just a neighbor. He also worked as a courtesy security officer for the building. So now, after the police established Bryant's connection to the area where Susanna was last seen, they decided to keep a close watch on him, hoping for any unusual behavior or clues that could link him to her disappearance after finding out that Susanna's body had been discovered. After days of surveillance and additional investigations, the Gwinnett County Police finally issued an arrest warrant for him. On the afternoon of February 13, 2023, Bryant was taken into custody. Authorities also searched Bryant's residence and collected a bedsheet from his car and impounded both his personal vehicle and his patrol car as part of their investigation. A few days after Miles Bryant's arrest, he found himself facing some serious charges. The authorities accused him of concealing Susanna Morales' death and also of making a false report about his missing gun. Although the detectives didn't disclose the details about whether Susanna had been physically assaulted, they were certain that she hadn't been shot. They believed that Bryant's gun wasn't involved in the murder. Instead, they suspected he might have lost it or accidentally dropped it while leaving the scene. Now, after Bryant's arrest, the Doraville Police Department, where he used to work, issued a statement. They confirmed that they were informed on Monday, February 13, 2023, that a former police officer was being served felony arrest warrants by the Gwyneth County Police Department. The city of Doraville and its police department pledged full cooperation with Gwinnett County authorities in the ongoing investigation. Their thoughts and prayers were with Susanna's family, friends, and all those affected by this heartbreaking tragedy. Soon, the police department also held a press conference and described this as an unimaginable tragedy that had deeply impacted both the community and law enforcement. They said that while they were still unsure as to how Susanna was killed, they were sure that Miles Bryant was responsible. So how did she die? We don't definitively know. We're still investigating. What we do know is that she died at the hands of Miles Bryant. The shocking part was that the crime was committed by a police officer, which made it even more distressing. Detectives expressed their strong determination to uncover the full truth behind what happened to Susanna on the night of July 26, 2022. There were many theories about the incident that the police considered, and according to their findings, after Susanna texted her mother slightly before 10 p.m. on July 26, telling her she was on her way home, something happened between 10 and 10.30 p.m. During this time, they believe Susanna crossed paths with Bryant, who somehow convinced her to get into his car. The details of what transpired afterward remain a mystery, 
but investigators suspect that Susanna tragically lost her life sometime between 10 p.m. on July 26th and 2 a.m. on July 27th. Despite these theories, there were some unanswered questions. Authorities couldn't find any evidence that Susanna and Bryant knew each other. So why would a 16-year-old willingly get into a stranger's car, especially when she was so close to home? Susanna's family also came forward and revealed that they were completely unaware of who Bryant was. They had a chilling theory that perhaps, living in the same apartment complex as Susanna's friend, he'd noticed her going about her daily life and secretly plotted her abduction. The tragic night of July 26, 2022, might have presented him with the opportunity he'd been waiting for, a chance to put his sinister plans into action. On the other hand, police considered an alternative theory that this might have been a random attack. They speculated that Bryant might never have crossed paths with Susanna before. However, that particular night, seeing her walking alone, he might have seized the opportunity to take advantage of her vulnerability. Some even suspected that he could have used his position as a police officer to manipulate Susanna and coax her into his vehicle. While these theories swirled, the one thing the police were certain about was that Bryant's intentions appeared to be deadly from the start. Learning that a police officer was responsible for her sister's death left Jasmine in utter disbelief. Completely shocked, honestly. It's, I have no words, honestly. It just, I didn't expect it. We didn't expect it. We didn't, we didn't know what to expect, but um, the officer was probably like the least on my mind. The last thing they'd ever imagined was that a person sworn to protect and serve the community could be the one behind this terrible crime. The idea that a law enforcement officer could commit such a heinous act was something that had never crossed their minds. However, there were more twists still to come. Aside from the surprising revelations about Bryant, it came to light that back in 2018, he'd faced accusations of attempting to enter a neighbor's house through a window. When the police responded to the incident, Bryant adamantly denied any wrongdoing, claiming he'd never tried to enter through the window. Strangely, the neighbor decided not to press charges against Bryant, and the matter was ultimately closed without any further investigation. Just when it appeared that every aspect of this grim story had been revealed, there was more to uncover. Shortly after all these news and revelations, a woman named Alicia Bates bravely stepped forward to share her disturbing encounter with Bryant. He was capable of it. When the officers asked me why he was trying to break in my apartment, I told him that I was scared that he was trying to rape me. She revealed that around the same time that Susanna disappeared, she'd actually been stalked by Miles Bryant. This screen grab of a man in military fatigues from October shows the first time Bates says a neighbor's camera recorded him at her door. She says two other videos from December show him back there again, covering his face and pulling on the door handle, then again knocking. Alicia, who's now 21 years old, had known Bryant since the fifth grade. However, as they grew older, Bryant attempted to reconnect with her, but she always felt uncomfortable and uneasy around him. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm in the neighborhood. I'll pull up. I said, no, I'll let you know if you can ever pull up. So Alicia made it crystal clear to Bryant that she wanted nothing to do with him and insisted that he stay away from her. However, Bryant's response to Alicia's request was far from ordinary. Instead of respecting her wishes, he began to stalk and harass her. On March 19th, she says someone kicked in her door and she stopped talking to him because things got suspicious. In December, she says she hid in her home with a gun when the now former Dorville police officer came to her door two more times unannounced. He was so aggressive that Alicia felt the need to protect herself, so she took the drastic step of acquiring a firearm out of fear for her life. I'd have a better advantage if I had a firearm at a distance than up close, since he's probably familiar with combat. She also reported Bryant's disturbing behavior to both the Dorville Police Department and the Gwinnett County Police Department. However, her fear persisted because Bryant was a police officer and she worried that her complaints might fall on deaf ears, which would lead to no meaningful action being taken against him. On one unsettling day when Alicia was away from her home, someone made a brazen attempt to break into her apartment. Fortunately, a neighbor had a ring camera that captured the disturbing incident. As Alicia reviewed the footage, she was shocked because the intruder was none other than Bryant himself. In this footage, Bryant can be seen lurking around Alicia's apartment, trying to force open the door and tugging at the doorknob. 
he even wore a hoodie to conceal his identity. But what's truly shocking was that when Alicia reported this terrifying incident to the Doraville Police Department, there was no meaningful action taken. They did initiate an administrative investigation into Brian's behavior, but it resulted in no significant consequences for him. Astonishingly, the response was simply a conversation with Brian where they told him to cease his stalking and harassment. There was no firing, no punishments. It ended with just words. However, now that Bryant was being arrested for the murder of Susanna, the Gwinnett County Police Department had pledged to reopen Alicia's case, which would shed light on one more disturbing chapter in this unsettling story. Despite her own encounter, Susanna's case was a shock to Alicia. She couldn't contemplate the fact that not only had Bryant been possibly harassing Susanna, but he'd also taken her life. She expressed her deep regrets regarding this tragedy. Alicia strongly believes that both the Doraville Police Department and the Gwinnett County Police Department didn't step up enough. If they'd taken her report seriously right from the beginning, Bryant might have been arrested and held accountable sooner. In her eyes, that could have made all the difference, and perhaps Susanna would still be with us today. 22-year-old Miles Bryant finally appeared in court on March 23, 2023, where he faced his charges. The judge made a significant decision by denying him bond, expressing concerns about the danger he posed to the community. Interestingly, in early March, another troubling charge was added to his list of criminal activities. Mr. Miles, I'm Judge Brogdon. Uh, you have two added felony charges. Do you know why you're here, sir? Yes, sir. And do you know what those new charges are? Yes, sir. It was related to a 2019 incident when a woman he had attended high school with had her home broken into while she was away. Security cameras captured the intruder, and she also reported it to the police back then, but the case was closed. However, after Bryant's arrest, this woman recognized him and became convinced that he was the person who had broken into her home back in 2019. She returned to the police, not only to tell them about it, but also to emphasize that she'd never shared her address with Bryant. Now, there was sufficient evidence to charge Bryant. On May 1st, 2023, Bryant found himself back in court, but this time, he was appealing to the judge for bond. The prosecution was also well prepared for their arguments. As Bryant walked into the courtroom in handcuffs and his waist restrained, one of the family members couldn't bear the emotion, breaking down in tears and walking out of the courtroom. The prosecution detailed all the disturbing instances where Bryant exploited his authority as a Doraville police officer and engaged in troubling behavior. This included breaking into women's homes, pilfering their belongings, and even invading a woman's privacy by accessing her phone and stealing her personal videos. He was on duty and in uniform, asked her to utilize her cell phone because he needed to log into his bank. And instead of doing so, he accessed her videos and sent himself videos of conducting sexual activity on her phone. He's a danger to women in this community. He is a, uh, has, has not upheld the oath that he took to protect and serve both the citizens of Doraville and the state of Georgia. So despite Bryant's attorney's attempts to argue for a reduced bond, the judge firmly denied the request. As is always in a criminal case, there is another side to some of these allegations. As a result, Bryant will remain in jail until his next hearing, the date of which is currently unknown. We'll continue to monitor this case closely, and as soon as any new information surfaces, we'll ensure to bring you the latest updates promptly. Even though this case was solved, still, there's a lingering disappointment in the community regarding the police department's handling of the situation. Many were left questioning why the police had enforced their own 48-hour rule in Susanna's case. According to Title 35 of the Georgia Code, such a policy is prohibited, stating that law enforcement agencies should not have a mandatory waiting period before initiating a missing person report. It's left to the discretion of the law enforcement agency to determine the necessary actions in response to such reports. This essentially means that the police department was completely in the wrong to delay making a report for 48 hours. And to make matters worse, there was no reasonable explanation for the Gwinnett County Police Department 
to take an entire month before publicly addressing Susanna's disappearance, even when they had all the evidence. Alongside their frustration with the Gwinnett Police Department, Susanna's family also holds the Dorville Police Department responsible for their handling of the hiring process. Their attorney, Alex Northover, expressed concerns that the Dorville Police failed to make necessary corrective actions in advance. The City of Dorville Police Department knew or should have known the dangers presented by then police officer Miles Bryant, but failed to take any corrective action. There were multiple indications that, that this individual um, presented a danger um, there was a previous allegation of stalking. Take responsibility for their role in this tragic incident and take measures to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The case against Bryant is still ongoing and there's hope that justice will be served for Susanna and her family. This case has also stirred many questions and concerns in the community, particularly about how missing children of different backgrounds are treated. In response, Susanna's family also organized a panel discussion in Gwinnett County to address these important issues. As a parent, there's nothing more terrifying than having your child go missing. But as a mother, a woman who has carried and birthed that child into this world, that is a pain beyond expression. And the devastation that follows the discovery that your missing child was murdered is unspeakable. For all the parents in this audience, pause right now and imagine the worst. Your baby goes missing for a day, seven days, 14 days, a month, two months, seven months, and then one day, police contact you asking for a DNA sample, and your child turns up in literal pieces. That's what this mother and sister went through. The family of Susana Morales. We're here today because there has never been a just America. There has never been equality and justice for all. And there has been no life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for this family. And it's not just for that county. In Washington, D.C., there are still dozens of unsolved missing cases related to black and brown girls under the age of 21. Families like Susanna's come to America for the very thing that we just can't seem to offer them. Peace and safety. There is nothing natural about a parent losing a child. But for a parent to have to bypass that grief in order to have the stamina to fight for justice for that child, that is an unconscionable act. And yet, that's exactly the new reality for Maria Brown and Jasmine Morales. The Morales family can now find some peace knowing that their daughter's murderer has been caught. They're now patiently awaiting the day when he'll face the consequences he deserves for his terrible actions. What are your thoughts about this case? What were the key factors that contributed to the delay in finding and solving Susanna Morales' case? Why do you think Miles Bryant killed Susanna Morales? Was that because he accidentally crossed paths with her that evening? Or was there something more behind the scenes? If there's a case you'd like us to cover... Don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comment section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories.